Chapter 1. A Message from William and Rita It's still lovely and sunny, said Elizabeth happily, as she came out of the first form classroom with her friend Julian and his cousin Patrick. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. Lessons at Whiteleaf School had finished for the day. Along the corridor, boys and girls were bursting out of other classrooms, laughing and chattering noisily. Soon everyone would change out of school uniform, go to tea, then race off to take part in all their summer term activities. There was always so much to do at Whiteleaf, thought Elizabeth. She loved it here now. She was still a monitor, though only an honorary one this term. There were no silly quarrels to worry about at present, no misunderstandings, no having to keep her temper. She and Patrick were just starting to get on reasonably well too. At the beginning of term, they had been sworn enemies. This is my favourite time of year, Elizabeth told Julian. The evenings are so light and long, it gives you time to fit everything in. I think I'll do some gardening later. I'm sure my lettuces need watering. You've got to come and watch my tennis match first, Patrick butted in. Elizabeth nodded that she would then continued. To think how much I hated it here at the beginning. It seems so strange now. I did everything I could to try and get myself sent home. You mean last summer, when you were the naughtiest girl in the school? asked Julian, his green eyes showing his amusement. Wish I'd been here then, poor Elizabeth. You've been trying to live it down ever since. Well, I have lived it down, said Elizabeth firmly. She wouldn't be a monitor if she hadn't, Patrick pointed out. Anyway, it wasn't all that strange. Hating it here at the beginning, I mean. Look at me. Three weeks ago, I couldn't stand the place. It was true. Julian's cousin was new this term. And although the two cousins looked rather alike, their characters were very different. Julian was lively and jokey, full of a self-confidence which came from being so clever and good at everything. He didn't, for example, in the least mind Elizabeth being a monitor. Patrick, when he'd first arrived, had been sullen and lacking in confidence, and he had deeply resented a girl telling him what to do. "'But you do like it here now, don't you, Patrick?' said Elizabeth. "'Not so terrible having a school with girls in it, is it?' said Julian wryly. And you've got your trial for the second tennis team. Already? I call that good going. Yes, not bad, Patrick flushed with pride. Don't you two forget to come and watch me either. I need supporters. We'll come and support you, piped up a voice in the corridor just behind them. It was Arabella Buckley with a friend. We'll come and cheer Patrick on, won't we, Rosemary? Of course we'll come said Rosemary, who always agreed with everything Arabella said. We'll be there, Patrick, said Elizabeth quietly. You know you can do it. I'm sure you can beat Roger. Roger Brown was a big boy in his last term at Whiteleaf, but even so, he was only clinging on to his place in the school's second team by his fingertips. Mr. Warlow, the sportsmaster, had watched Patrick play. He had also noted how hard the new boy practised each day, so a trial had been arranged. After tea today, Roger and Patrick were to play singles against each other. Everybody knew that if Patrick proved to be the stronger player, he would be awarded that precious place in the second team. "'You'll need that special racket of yours, though, Patrick,' said Julian. "'Better not let Elizabeth get anywhere near it. You know what she's like.' He kept a straight face as he said it, for a moment, Elizabeth took him seriously. Julian Holland, what a hateful thing to say! Once, in a fit of rage with Patrick, Elizabeth had caused his lovely new racket to get soaked with rain. She hated to be reminded of it now. It was Patrick who quickly smoothed things over. Don't worry, I'll guard it with my life, he smiled. Elizabeth smiled then too, and the awkward moment passed. At tea time, she even managed to make a joke at her own expense. Patrick had changed into his tennis things and come over to join Elizabeth's table, carrying his precious tennis racket. It really was his pride and joy. 
If anything can bring me luck, it's this, he told John McTavish. I'm useless with any other racket. Better not leave it by my chair then, Patrick, said Elizabeth. I think you ought to padlock it to the table leg. You know what I'm like. All the boys and girls at the table laughed. Julian gave Elizabeth's arm an approving pinch. He was pleased to see his friend not taking herself too seriously. Arabella, however, turned her pretty little doll-like face towards Patrick and smiled primly. It wasn't so funny at the time, though, was it, Patrick? she said. Elizabeth ground her teeth. She tried hard to think of something clever to say to get back at Arabella, but at that moment someone came hurrying over to their table. Elizabeth? Joan! Elizabeth was always pleased to see her special friend. But Joan was older and had gone up to the second form quite quickly, so the two girls saw less of each other these days. Elizabeth knew that if she did well at lessons this term, she too would go up in September. Then she and Joan would be together again. Elizabeth was looking forward to that. I've got a message for you, said Joan softly. She was always quietly spoken. It's from William and Rita. They would like you to come along to their study after tea, please. Elizabeth frowned in surprise. William and Rita were the head boy and the head girl of Whiteleaf School. Are you coming too? Are all the monitors coming? Elizabeth asked. She was puzzled because there was no school meeting due for a day or two yet. Sometimes all the monitors were called in if there was something important to discuss before the meeting. The meeting was held once a week. All pupils had to attend. It was a kind of parliament. At Whiteleaf, it was the boys and girls themselves who made many of the important rules and saw that they were applied fairly. When problems arose, they sorted them out themselves. The teachers rarely had to be involved. No, they just want you, said Joan. I don't know what it's about. Elizabeth rushed through her tea after that. What did William and Rita want to see her about? Hey, monitor, don't gobble your food. You're supposed to set a good example. Teased Julian. William and Rita aren't going to disappear down a big hole. They can wait, he added carelessly. I'll finish up your scrambled egg if you can't manage it all, Elizabeth, said her friend Kathleen, all smiles and rosy cheeks as usual. Would you really like it? asked Elizabeth gratefully. Cook's given me too much. Then I can slip off and see what they want with me. I haven't done anything bad lately, have I, Kathleen? She picked up her remaining chocolate biscuits, put them in her pocket, scraped her chair back, then got up and left the table. If you'd done anything bad, it would have to wait for the meeting, Elizabeth, Julian called after her, and the whole school would have to hear about it. You know that's the system here. See you later. Come straight on to the tennis courts, Patrick added. I'll be playing soon. But Elizabeth, hurrying out of the hall, didn't hear them. The chatter and clatter from other tables filled her ears and drowned out the boys' voices. There was only one thought in her mind at present. Why had the head boy and girl asked her to come and see them? Chapter 2 Elizabeth Upsets Patrick Come in, called the head boy, as Elizabeth tip tapped nervously on the study door. It was a lovely sunny room with a big window. William and Rita were sitting in their armchairs. Rita pointed to the visitor's armchair. Do sit down, Elizabeth. She was smiling and speaking kindly. William was smiling too. The little girl's heart stopped beating quite so fast. She sat down in the visitor's armchair with its cheerful chintz cover. We've got a problem, explained William. We have discussed it with Miss Bell. But now we'd like your advice. We would like to know what you think. Miss Bell! Elizabeth's chest swelled with pride. Miss Bell and Miss Best were the joint headmistresses of Whiteleaf School. The children called them the Beauty and the Beast. If Miss Bell were involved in this, then it must be an important matter on which her opinion was being sought. Rita decided they should get it over quickly. The fact is, we shouldn't really have thirteen monitors, she said. It's always been the tradition that we have twelve, 
and as I'm sure you've noticed at the meetings this term, Elizabeth, it's almost impossible to get thirteen chairs on the platform. There's always one person practically falling off the end. Elizabeth nodded. She had noticed that. It had all come about because, owing to lots of misunderstandings last term, Elizabeth had lost her position as monitor. A second former, Susan, had been elected in her place. But then, at the end of term, when all the misunderstandings had been sorted out, the first form had asked for Elizabeth to be reinstated as an honorary monitor. For once, in a way, we must have an extra one. Miss Bell had agreed, for she knew how much Elizabeth wanted to prove herself a good, wise, and sensible monitor. After some of the reckless things she had done, it seemed such a lovely idea to have an extra monitor at the time. Continued Rita, but we've discussed it with Miss Bell, and we're all agreed that it can't be a permanent arrangement. William looked straight at Elizabeth. We've been wondering whether we should ask Susan to stand down, Elizabeth. What do you think? Poor Susan, that wouldn't be fair," exclaimed Elizabeth without hesitation. She has had hardly any time as a monitor, and she was elected by the whole school, with proper votes and everything. Her voice tailed away. She swallowed very hard. There was no alternative. Let me stand down," she said nobly. With a weak, wobbly smile, I've had a good turn as a monitor now. I wanted to prove myself. You have certainly done that, Elizabeth," said Rita. "Good kid," said William softly. "Are you quite sure, Elizabeth? We could ask Susan, you know. She was only elected because of the misunderstandings about your behaviour." "I am quite sure," said Elizabeth, somehow managing to keep that brave, wobbly smile in place. She wanted to rush away now, as fast as she possibly could. Well done, Elizabeth," said Rita. "William will announce it at this week's meeting." Then, as Elizabeth left the study, William held open the door for her. He gave her a pat on the back as she went. "You will be elected monitor again one day, Elizabeth. I am quite sure of that." "Thank you, William," replied Elizabeth, feeling very noble. She was proud of herself for being so calm and sensible in front of William and Rita, but as soon as the study door closed behind her, she felt a hot prickling sensation behind her eyes. She was going to cry. She must run somewhere safe where nobody could see her. No longer a monitor. She needed to be alone. She needed time to think, to get over the shock. Where could she go? Where was quiet and unhurried, peaceful? The school gardens. She often went there when she wanted to think. She made a bee line for the gardens at once. She shut herself in the farthest greenhouse. Then she let the tears flow. It's not fair, she sobbed. It's not, not fair. She forgot all about Patrick and his tennis trial. She forgot that she had promised to come and support him. Patrick's hopes and dreams had completely slipped her mind. Pull yourself together, Elizabeth Allen," she told herself some time later. "Stop being a silly baby. It's perfectly fair, and you know it is." She dried her eyes as best she could. She put her sodden handkerchief away in her pocket. Then she peeped cautiously through the greenhouse windows. There were very few people around. There was no sign of John Terry, the senior boy who ran the school gardens. Good. She did not feel like facing anyone yet, not even John. He was the most kind and understanding of boys, of course. He cared nothing for important positions, monitorships, and the like, only for his beloved garden. John was a genius at growing things and at teaching others how to grow them. With his team of volunteers, he helped to provide enough fresh fruit and vegetables to supply the kitchens at Whiteleaf School for much of the year. Even so. She wanted a little more time on her own. Elizabeth, she told herself, "You will no longer be a monitor after this week's meeting. Just get that into your head. It's perfectly fair, and you've got to accept it." She felt rather cross with herself for not having foreseen this. It was quite true that since the beginning of term, it had been uncomfortable and awkward having an extra chair on the platform at meetings. 
She should have offered to stand down earlier, but it was such fun being a monitor. You wanted it to go on forever, so she had simply buried her head in the sand as an ostrich does when it sees trouble ahead. All good things come to an end, Elizabeth. Her last governess used to tell her, and sometimes sooner than you expect. Elizabeth had never listened to a word that Miss Scott said. She blushed to think how rude she had been, of all the awful things she had said, not only to Miss Scott but to the long line of governesses before her. Not surprisingly, none of them had ever stayed very long. But now she realised Miss Scott had been speaking sense after all. But Rita says I've proved I can be a good monitor, and William says my turn will come again. Elizabeth began to feel more cheerful. It was very warm in the greenhouse. She went and opened the door wide and stood there for a while, gazing out. The sun was sinking lower. A gentle breeze was making rustling sounds in the blackcurrant bushes. Somewhere, a blackbird was singing. A sweet, warm scent wafted from the wallflowers that bordered the nearest vegetable plot. There were butterflies settled there, sharing the flowers with the buzzing bees. In a reverie, Elizabeth found her chocolate biscuits rather warm and sticky by now. She ate them slowly, a melting mouthful at a time. There's more to life than being a monitor, Elizabeth decided. I shall have more time to myself. I must try and get good at lots of things. I shall make myself learn to be a brilliant gardener and grow wonderful things. She stared at the neat rows of broad beans that John and some of the younger boys had planted. How well they seemed to be doing, although they did need weeding. Most of Elizabeth's efforts to grow things so far had come to grief, usually because she had forgotten to look after them properly. But she knew that her lettuces were doing well. She closed the greenhouse door behind her and slowly walked round to have a look at them. They've grown again! She exclaimed as she came round the corner. She had spent some of her own allowance on lettuce seeds. John had told her it was always worth getting the very best quality. She had planted the seeds out in neat rows, watched them grow into tiny lettuces, weeded them carefully once a week. Now she was beginning to get her reward. The lettuces had suddenly burgeoned. Some of them had formed proper hearts. They were beginning to look like real lettuces. At this rate, they would be ready before half term. Her lettuces would be going into lots of school salads. That thought made Elizabeth feel very proud. But they do need watering, poor things. She realised. The ground all around them is quite parched looking. I'll go and fill the watering cans. The two watering cans were lined up by the garden tap. Before filling them, Elizabeth turned on the tap and cupped some water in her hands. She washed the chocolate off her hands, then doused her face clean. Now nobody would be able to see that she'd been crying. She filled the watering cans, but when she reached her lettuce row, she stopped. Was there still some heat in the sun? John had once explained to her that watering should be done in the cool of the day, morning or evening. So Elizabeth set to work weeding between the rows of broad beans instead. It was hard physical work, and it had a wonderfully soothing effect on her. By the time she had finished, she felt glowing with good health and much more at peace with herself. She could face the world now. I'm getting quite used to the idea of not being a monitor, she told herself. I shan't tell anyone yet. I'll wait till it's announced at the meeting. That will give me a bit more time to get really calm and strong about it. I expect Julian will tease me. I hope Arabella doesn't crow. The sun was now much cooler. Elizabeth returned to her lettuces and carefully watered each row. She had just finished when John Terry appeared. There were other boys and girls arriving too. She could hear their voices beyond the yew hedge. "That's well done, Elizabeth. Just the right amount of water," he said. "You don't want to drown them. They're doing well, aren't they? Do you think so, John? I'll tell you something, though." This is the last time you'll have to water them for a while. He looked up at the sky. This is the end of the sunshine. There's going to be heavy rain for two or three days. 
Like any good gardener, John always took careful notes of the weather forecast. Oh, is there? But it will save me a job then, said Elizabeth cheerfully. Well, it will save you one job, but it could give you another. You see, Elizabeth, John! Someone shouted. Before John could finish, a boy came marching over carrying a garden fork. Where exactly do you want this ground turned over? asked the boy. I'll show you in a minute. I just want to explain something to Elizabeth. But Elizabeth was staring at the new arrival in dismay. He was a large, heavily built boy, one of the oldest in the school. He often came and helped in the gardens. He had big feet and big red hands and a gentle face. Elizabeth noticed how pale he looked, as though he were unwell. He was still in his tennis shorts. It was Roger Brown, Patrick's tennis opponent. The match must be over. Patrick's tennis trial. It had gone right out of her mind. It's all right, John. I've got a dash now. Elizabeth started running. Tell me another time. I've realized I shouldn't be here, she called back. She ran as fast as she could, all the way to the tennis courts. Patrick was sitting on a bench near the courts with Julian, surrounded by first formers. Elizabeth raced towards them, panting for breath. Did you win, Patrick? she shouted. Of course he did, shrilled Arabella. Elizabeth! exclaimed Julian. What happened to you? Why didn't you come? Elizabeth went very red. I forgot, she said. Patrick won, cried Arabella triumphantly. He's going to be in the second team. It made all the difference to him, having his friends here, cheering him on. Fancy you just forgetting to come, Elizabeth. Elizabeth thought how horrible it sounded put like that. She pushed past Arabella to get to Patrick, her hand outstretched. She wanted to shake his hand. Congratulations, Patrick. You really deserve to be in the team after all your hard work. I truly meant to come and watch the match. I'm sorry. It's just that after I'd been to see William and Rita, I had such important things. She broke off. She had been going to say such important things to think about, but that sounded bad too, as though Patrick's tennis trial was not important. In any case, Patrick was ignoring her outstretched hand. He was getting to his feet. I've got important things to do as well, he said. Now I'm in the second team, I've got to do some more work on my service action. I'm going to have a good go against the school wall. There's a match on Saturday. Without even glancing at Elizabeth, he strode away. There was a sulky expression on his face. He was overjoyed to have beaten Roger and to have won his place in the team. But he'd been wondering what had happened to Elizabeth. He had even, in fact, been worrying about her. Whereas she, it seemed, had simply forgotten all about him. What were these important things, anyway? Later, he learnt from young Peter what Elizabeth had been doing while his match was in progress. She had been weeding some vegetable plot in the school gardens. Peter had seen her there. That was all. Weeding. Even Julian's eyebrows shot up in surprise when Patrick passed on this information. She's good at heart, though, Patrick, he shrugged. You'll find that out. Elizabeth had no intention of confessing to Julian, far less to Patrick, that she had been crying like a baby in the greenhouse. But she would go out of her way to be nice to Patrick, she decided. Then he would soon forget her lapse. In fact, by cocoa time that evening, Patrick was already in a mood to forgive Elizabeth and give her another chance. His serving practice had gone well, and he was very excited about the match against Woodville on Saturday. It's a home match, so you'll have to come and watch, he told Elizabeth, especially as you're a monitor. Elizabeth smiled wryly, thinking of the surprise in store for them all at the weekly meeting. She chose her words with care. Monitor or not, she said, I'll be there. Chapter 3 Patrick Makes a Little Joke It was time for the weekly meeting. The whole school was required to attend. The boys and girls looked forward to it. It was the day their money was given out. After that, there were always complaints to be heard and interesting things to discuss. It had been raining for two days and outdoor hobbies had been cancelled, even riding. They were pleased to have the meeting coming up after tea to liven things up. The weather was supposed to get better by the evening, much to Patrick's relief. 
He was longing to get more practice before Saturday's match. All the children trooped into the gym, which doubled as the school hall. In the Easter holidays, a platform had been built at one end for the children's little plays and concerts. It made the meetings much better too. There was a long row of chairs up on the platform, facing into the hall. There sat the school's twelve elected monitors, six each side of the head boy and girl. William and Rita, in the centre, sat behind a small table. On the table was a big book in which lots of things were written. By the book lay a small hammer, which they used like a judge's gavel. They were rather like judges, with their jury alongside them. Elizabeth always thought. This was not only the school's parliament, where problems were discussed and rules made; it was also its court. All complaints of bad behaviour or wrongdoing had to be brought to the meeting. Problems were aired in public, punishments decided upon if necessary. Above all, boys and girls were made to face up honestly to their faults. Miss Bell and Miss Best, the joint headmistresses, sat right at the back of the hall with Mr. Johns, the senior master. They rarely took any part in the proceedings, and only then if their advice was requested. Elizabeth had hated the meetings when she first came to Whiteleaf School. She had thought them a perfectly silly idea. She had since changed her opinion. But where was she today? That's funny," said Julian as he filed into the hall with the rest of the first form. He was staring towards the platform. Why isn't Elizabeth up there with the other monitors? She must be late," giggled Belinda. "But there's no chair up there for her either." Julian was always very quick to notice things. It's odd. Elizabeth had still not told anybody. It had been too early to tell. She had reasoned. It would come out at the meeting. She would be quite composed by then. That would be soon enough. I wonder what's going on," mused Julian. Now, he did not have to wait long to find out. All the benches in the hall had filled up. Some of the younger children sat cross-legged on the floor. They were in the junior class, which was below the first form. The babble of whispering and chattering was getting louder and louder. William stood up and banged the gavel. Silence, please. There was an instant hush. Before the meeting starts, I have something to say. He smiled down at the person who was perched on the very end of a bench in the front row. Stand up, please, Elizabeth. Come up here onto the platform. As she stood up, for all her resolve, Elizabeth found her legs going wobbly. She felt butterflies in her tummy. The whole school was looking at her. She had so hoped that William or Rita would just make the announcement very quickly and quietly. This was awful. Determined to look dignified, she walked slowly up onto the platform. Julian and the others watched in surprise. It was their very own Elizabeth, the bold bad girl. What was all this about? For much of last term, Elizabeth was a monitor. William told the school. This term, as a special dispensation, we asked her to stay on for a while as an honorary monitor. We were so proud of her, weren't we? Well, she has done a really good stint, and the time's come for Elizabeth to stand down now. I think we are all agreed that she has been a very fine monitor indeed. I want us all to show our appreciation. He gave a brief nod. Rita rose from her chair. Then all twelve monitors on the platform did likewise. As William shook Elizabeth by the hand, the head girl and monitors gave her a standing ovation. The whole school joined in. With her head held high, Elizabeth came down from the platform. As she walked down the hall to join her own form's benches, children on all sides started cheering loudly. After two days of being cooped up indoors, it was good to have an excuse to shout and cheer. Elizabeth felt weak with relief. The experience had not been humiliating after all; it had been just the reverse. How tactfully William and Rita had handled it! She felt buoyed up, almost cheerful. "You dark horse," whispered Julian as she sat down beside him. Belinda, Kathleen, even Patrick—they all slapped her on the back. 
Patrick had reason to know how good a monitor she had been, but was secretly relieved. He would never get used to the idea of girls being allowed to boss boys around. This would be better, he felt. Arabella was clapping politely, for quite the wrong reasons. Julian squeezed Elizabeth's arm. Brave girl, he hissed, green eyes twinkling. Alone amongst the first formers, he had continued to be curious to know why William and Rita had summoned her the other day. He had been mystified that Elizabeth, usually so talkative, had never referred to it. Now he understood. Elizabeth simply gave a huge sigh of relief. William was banging his gavel and calling for silence again. Time to get on with the meeting. Thank goodness that was all over. Thomas held up the big money box now. All the children who had been sent money during the past week had to come forward and drop it inside. After that, every member of the school was handed two pounds from the box as their spending money for the week. At White Leaf School, they did not believe in some children having more money to spend than others. This was the way they shared it out fairly. If any pupil wanted extra money for a special purpose, they had to ask. The meeting then decided if it was a proper reason. Please, I left all my stamps out in the rain, and now they're useless, said Peter, standing up. I need to write some letters this week. Can I have some extra money to buy more stamps? No, the stamps getting all messy and stuck together was due to Peter's own carelessness, the meeting decided. You'll just have to go without a few sweets this week, Rita said kindly. Mary wanted the florist shop in the village to send some flowers to her aunt, who was very ill in hospital. Request granted, said the head boy. Thomas, give Mary an extra five pounds from the box. After that, there were three complaints to be heard. Two were proper complaints, and one was silly. Arabella Buckley keeps making faces at me in class, said Daniel Carter. She keeps trying to make me laugh. And if I do laugh, I get into trouble. That is not a proper complaint, said William sternly. That is just telling tales. Sit down at once, Daniel. The first form were making spluttering sounds as they tried not to giggle. Try looking the other way, Daniel, whispered Belinda. Arabella's not making faces, hissed Julian. She always looks like that. Arabella, who had been feeling so triumphant, turned bright pink. She prided herself on her prettiness. William banged the table again. Before we close the meeting, some congratulations are in order. Roger, stand up, please. The big senior boy shambled to his feet. He was embarrassed to be in the limelight. His gentle face, even at the best of times, wore a slightly anxious look. It was just his normal expression. As we know, said William, Roger is in the top class and in his last term at Whiteleaf. He has just heard recently that he has won a scholarship to Holyfield School, an academic scholarship. Well done, Roger. Can we give him a round of applause, please? As everyone clapped, Roger Brown gave a shy nod, then quickly sat down. Isn't Holyfield a sporty school? whispered a second former to one of his classmates. Will he get on all right there? Everyone knew he'd lost his place in the second tennis team to a mere first former. They have other people as well, the friend whispered back. People who are musical or just plain brainy like Rog. He shall be all right. The first formers, as they trooped out of the hall, were much more interested in the news about Elizabeth. You can be ordinary Elizabeth Allen now, said Belinda kindly. It will give you more time for riding and everything. Will it feel funny not being a monitor any more? asked Kathleen. Just for a while, I expect, replied Elizabeth calmly. The boys teased her a bit, especially Julian. Now you can go straight back to being the naughtiest girl in the school again, he laughed. Never, retorted Elizabeth. She was standing up to the teasing well. But then Patrick struck a discordant note. Of course, there's no need for you to come and watch me play in the school match now, he said. I won't want you there if you're not an important monitor. He was trying to make a joke, but Patrick's jokes were always rather heavy-handed. His words really stung. 
For a moment, Arabella and some of the others noted the look of dismay on Elizabeth's face. By the time the little girl realised that he was not being serious, the main doors had been opened and everybody was whooping and rushing outside. It had stopped raining at last. It was going to be a fine evening. Hooray! cried Patrick. I'll go and get my racket and practice my strokes. I must go over to the stables and see the horses! exclaimed Robert. People were scattering in all directions. My lettuces! thought Elizabeth. I can go and look at them. I am sure the rain won't have washed them away. They weren't little babies any more. I wonder if they've grown. Luckily, Elizabeth went and changed into her black wellies first, for there were puddles on all the paths in the school gardens. The big vegetable garden was all muddy and squelchy. She picked her way through the black currant bushes, where the weak sunshine glistened on the wet leaves. Then, on past the dripping yew hedges to where her lettuces lay, she gave a gasp of dismay. Oh no! She stood and stared at her rows of lettuce, unable to believe her eyes. Only three days ago, they had been such fine specimens, all plumping out nicely and forming hearts. Now they were unrecognizable. They're all chewed up. They look horrible. Ah! As she bent to touch the nearest plant, a fat black slug slid off it. Gazing along the rows, she saw another slug, then another. They were feasting on her lettuces. They must have been feasting on them for days. Elizabeth, John Terry appeared, carrying a large white jug. Oh, John, look, look! Horrible slugs, big fat black ones. They've eaten all my lettuces. They've ruined them. He came and put an arm round her shoulders. I know," he said sadly. He looked down at her disappointed face. Poor Elizabeth, this was what I was trying to warn you about the other day, when they said there was rain on the way. If only you hadn't been in such a hurry. You mean you knew this might happen? When it's very wet, we nearly always get an epidemic of slugs here. There are things you have to do about it. But what, John? I don't understand. Elizabeth frowned. Oh, why had she rushed away the other evening just to hear about Patrick's silly tennis trial? Why hadn't she stopped and listened to John? What can you do? Come with me, and I'll show you. Still carrying the jug, he led her to a warm, sheltered part of the garden. There stood two rows of the finest-looking lettuces anyone could hope for. One row consisted of the round variety, the other of the cross variety. The slugs have hardly got to them at all," exclaimed Elizabeth in surprise. "These are mine," said John quietly. "They're extra special, so I've had to take good care of them. We get slugs in this part of the garden too, though not as many. But look, come along the rows with me, and you'll see." For the first time, walking down the two rows with John, Elizabeth noticed there were old bowls placed at intervals, six of them in all. They were deep little bowls, old and chipped, formerly school soup bowls, but long since thrown out. Elizabeth crouched down and peered inside one. "It's full of dead slugs!" she shrieked. "They all are," replied John. "They've all been drowned. Now, what would I do? And I'll explain." John put down his jug. Then, working quickly, he gathered up the bowls two at a time. He tipped the bowlfuls of slimy dead slugs on a nearby rubbish heap, then replaced the empty bowls in position. Some people put down pellets to kill slugs, he told her, but that can be cruel. Pellets can harm other creatures too. This way is much better. He asked Elizabeth to hand him the jug. Is there milk in here? She said, sniffing. It smells a bit off. It is, smiled John. Cook always has plenty of old milk left over. It doesn't matter if it's a bit sour. I catch it off her. He went round his lettuces, slurping the clotting milk into the emptied bowls. The slugs love it. They even prefer it to lettuce. They climb into the bowls and drink till they're fat and bloated. They can't climb out again. They just quietly drown. They feel no pain. Elizabeth nodded. She was learning new things all the time. 
she went to the rubbish heap and stared with interest at the mound of dead slugs there. It was very satisfying. No more eating lettuce for any of you, she thought. It does make extra work, though, sighed John afterwards. Elizabeth noticed he looked rather tired. They say there's going to be a lot more wet weather next week. It's an extra job I could do without. That's what I was trying to explain to you, Elizabeth, that as soon as you stop having to water, there's a new job waiting to be done. They stood and looked at Elizabeth's lettuces, at the wreckage. Elizabeth bit her lip, furious both with the slugs and with herself. If only she'd stopped and listened to John, her lettuces might still be all right. To make matters worse, she had boasted about them too. How the first form would laugh if they could see them now. You must ask for extra money at the next meeting, said John kindly, to buy new seeds with. It's not too late for a second planting. They would be ready by August. Elizabeth shook her head stubbornly. The next meeting was a whole week away, August and eternity. It would be the summer holidays. Nobody would be here to see them. If she couldn't watch her own lettuces grow and flourish, she would just have to admire John's. I've got an idea, John, she exclaimed suddenly. Let me look after your lettuces instead. You've got far too many jobs to do. You look really tired lately. And now you've shown me how to get rid of the slugs. No, certainly not, said John sharply. The little girl was speechless. It was as though she had been slapped. Are you going back now, Elizabeth? he asked more gently. Could you take the jug back to cook for me, please? No, take it yourself, she cried rudely. Aren't you frightened I might drop it and break it? With that she raced off, boiling with rage. John, her friend John, was telling her she was useless. Not for one moment was she to be trusted with his precious lettuces. She could have wept with anger. She was still feeling upset an hour later. Hello, Elizabeth. Where did you disappear to? asked her friends as she came into the common room. It annoyed her that they all looked so cheerful and happy. They were building a castle out of playing cards. You're not supposed to use the best playing cards for doing that, said Elizabeth before she could stop herself. Only the old ones. But it's more fun with these, laughed Julian. From the other end of the room, Arabella was listening. You're not a monitor any more, she called out. Has it slipped your mind, Elizabeth? Elizabeth turned away. She didn't feel like being friendly and sociable this evening, or being teased. I'm tired, she said truthfully. I'm going to have an early night. Really, said Arabella later. Did you notice? Elizabeth's face was like a thundercloud. It must be because you made that little joke this afternoon, Patrick, about her not being important and not needing to come to watch the match. Perhaps she's sulking because she's not a monitor any more, suggested Rosemary. Do you really think so? wondered Patrick. Across the room, Julian got up, stretched and yawned. Don't be stupid, he said. His eyes were mocking. Elizabeth's made of stronger stuff than that. It will be something else, I expect. There will be something else going on in her head. He smiled to himself, with Elizabeth there nearly always was. Chapter 4 John Tells Elizabeth a Secret Julian was right, of course. Elizabeth went to bed that night, still feeling cross about the slugs, but even angrier that John had insulted her. The following morning in the dining hall, she chose to ignore him. Good morning, Elizabeth, he said, as they jostled to collect their cornflakes. Nice sunny one. Lower lip trembling slightly, she deliberately turned her back on him. Back at her table, all the talk was about the tennis match against Woodville today. Isn't it lucky the weather's fine, said rosy-cheeked Kathleen. Don't you think so, Elizabeth? Elizabeth said nothing. She could feel herself smouldering again. How could John behave as though nothing had happened? Everybody noticed how quiet she was. I was only joking yesterday, Elizabeth, Patrick said awkwardly when breakfast was over. You will come and watch the school match this afternoon, won't you? Elizabeth nodded, hardly taking in what he was saying. Her mind was elsewhere. Of course, Patrick. 
Then, as she came out of the hall, something unexpected happened. She found John Terry lying in wait for her. He took her firmly by the arm. I've got to speak to you, Elizabeth. He propelled her round the corner into the corridor, then gently pushed her into an empty classroom. Quick, in here, nobody must hear. Elizabeth was too surprised to protest. Her bad feelings about John began to melt away. What was this all about? What did he want to say to her that was so important? Now look, Elizabeth, he said once the door was safely closed. I didn't mean to upset you last night. You must have thought me really rude and cruel. It was kind of you to offer to look after my plants. But I had to shut you up. I was frightened I might give something away. Give something away? asked Elizabeth, puzzled. But she was already feeling better, much better. Look, Elizabeth, can you keep a secret? A really important one. At least, it's important to me. There's not one person in the school knows, nobody at all. Elizabeth began to feel excited and proud. Of course I can keep a secret, she replied. Cross your heart and swear to die. Elizabeth did so. Right. Well, this is a position. Lowering his voice, he explained everything. He had filled in forms for a competition. He was hoping his two varieties of lettuce would win a very special cup at the village show. The show was in two weeks' time, just before half term. As well as medals for crafts and woodworking, there was a silver cup for the best produce grown by a young person under sixteen. It could be fruit, flower, plant, or vegetable. John was a modest boy. He was not doing this in the hope of personal glory. That was a last thing on his mind. If by any chance my lettuces win the cup, it will be a great honour for the school. The local people sometimes grumble about us and think we have a soft life. This would show them that we don't, that we're not afraid to get our hands dirty and work the soil and grow good things. It would be in the local newspaper as well, said Elizabeth, feeling excited. Then everybody would find out what a good school it is and that we're allowed to do things for ourselves here. She paused. But why must it be such a secret, John? I'd love to tell everyone. Don't you dare, he said fiercely. Suddenly Elizabeth realised just how important this was to him. He could not bear the idea of failing, nor would he be able to bear it for everyone to know he had failed. If by any chance I pull it off and win the cup, I want it to be a complete surprise. Now promise me again that you'll keep my secret. I promise, said Elizabeth solemnly. I truly swear. I've only told you because I wanted you to know why, last night, I wanted you to understand. John, I'm so glad you've told me, said Elizabeth. She looked ashamed. And I'm sorry I was so rude and hot tempered. I do understand now. Of course, you couldn't trust me to look after your plants when it's so important. John looked at her in surprise. He interrupted her. Oh, Elizabeth, you still don't understand. I suppose I haven't explained properly. I would trust you to look after them. You're one of my best young helpers. You make mistakes sometimes, but you learn fast. No, it's not that. Elizabeth was beginning to feel a warm glow of happiness spreading through her. It's the competition rules, he said. I've signed the entry forms and I had to vouch that whatever I grow will be my own unaided work. Except for all the help nature gives me, of course, he added, smiling. Don't you see, Elizabeth? Nobody is allowed to help me with these lettuces in any way. Don't you dare even try to water them for me. As they emerged from the empty classroom and went their separate ways, Elizabeth wanted to laugh out loud with happiness. She had completely misjudged John. She had been silly and hot headed and jumped to conclusions. Now everything was all right again. She was so pleased he had shared his secret with her. She would keep it safe. Later that morning, Julian asked her to go out riding with him. He noticed how happy she seemed as they trotted along on their ponies, side by side. You were like a bear with a sore head earlier, he remarked lightly. Was something the matter? It was just a misunderstanding about something, replied Elizabeth cheerfully. Oh, Julian smiled. I might have guessed. At Elizabeth's dinner table, all the talk was about the afternoon's match against Woodville. The visitors were due to arrive at two o'clock. The first formers were all proud that Patrick was playing in the second team. 
I've got to find my best form, said Patrick edgily. He was feeling nervous. It was quite understandable. I did well in the trial, but if I play badly today, it will be me out and Roger back in again. We're all going to come and cheer you on, Patrick, said Elizabeth. After dinner, he left early to change into his tennis things. He now had a special badge sewn on his tennis shirt. It was a blue shield which showed that he was a second team player. He kept his precious tennis racket in a special place. He would collect that first before he changed. He was planning to get in a few practice strokes before the match. The others sat around chatting in the dining hall. They watched through the big windows as a minibus appeared in the drive. Here they come, said Elizabeth. Watching this match is going to be fun. Why are you in such a good mood all of a sudden? asked Arabella. Am I? asked Elizabeth. Well, it's none of your business, even if I am. She stuck her tongue out at Arabella. Not being a monitor and having to set a good example had its compensations sometimes. Stop it, you two, said Kathleen. Let's go and bag places near the courts. We want to have a good view. Coming out of the dining hall, they saw Patrick rushing towards them. It was such a shock. He hadn't changed yet. His black hair was completely dishevelled. His face was pale and distraught. My tennis racket, he croaked. I've been looking for it everywhere. It's gone. Somebody must have taken it. Chapter 5 Elizabeth is Angry. Patrick confronted Elizabeth. He was extremely agitated. Elizabeth, is this some kind of joke? he asked. Have you hidden my racket? If you have, please give it back, he pleaded. The match is starting in less than fifteen minutes. She stared at him in surprise. I don't know what you're talking about, Patrick, she replied coldly. Of course she doesn't, Julian scolded his cousin, as if Elizabeth would hide your racket. What about the time she threw it in the bushes? That was completely different, replied Julian. Look, stop saying stupid things, Patrick. Try to think clearly. You must have mislaid it, he added. If the worst comes to the worst, I'll lend you mine. I don't want your silly old racket, exploded Patrick. Mine's the only one I can play with properly. You know that perfectly well. I haven't mislaid it. It should be on the top shelf in the sports cupboard. Everybody knows that's where I keep it, and it isn't there, I tell you. It was such an unexpected thing to happen. The first formers all gathered round him, feeling worried and surprised. They so wanted to see Patrick do well in his first match. They'd been looking forward to it. Meanwhile, the two dark-haired, green-eyed cousins squared up to each other as if spoiling for a fight. Kathleen pushed the pair apart. Stop quarrelling, for goodness sake. Let's all try and do something. Yes, let's try and find Patrick's racket for him, exclaimed Belinda. Julian's anger at his cousin's rudeness suddenly passed. He could see how desperate he looked. He cooled down and took command of the situation. Patrick, dash and get changed, he said, giving him a gentle push. You've only just got time. The rest of us will look for the racket. It can't be far away. I'm sure we'll find it. With a helpless shrug, Patrick strode off. Julian organised a search party. Martin, while he's in the changing rooms, you go and hunt around his dormy. He puts the racket under his bed sometimes, whatever he says. Kathleen, could you come with me? We'll search the sports cupboard. It might have slipped to the very back of the shelf. Elizabeth, would you go round to the south wall? He spends hours there practising his strokes. He might have left it behind. Soon Julian had everybody rushing round the school, hunting for the missing racket, even some of the second formers. Elizabeth was not quite so forgiving. She felt hot and bothered inside at the way Patrick had insulted her. How dare he suggest that she might play a joke on him, just before his important match. As if she would do something like that, even to her worst enemy. Nevertheless, she hurried out of the building and made her way to Patrick's favourite spot. He loved to come here near the shrubbery and bang tennis balls against the wall over and over again. Julian had a point. He might have left the racket behind last time. She ran up and down looking for it. 
She even hunted round the corner, but there was no sign of it. She stared towards the bushes. Was it possible that Patrick had used it to search for a ball? The holly, for example, was very prickly. It was easier to part the leaves with one's racket than use one's hands. Somewhere in the distance, she could hear children coming outside, calling to one another despondently. It's no use. It's definitely not in the building. He must have left it outside somewhere. Let's look round the field. If Patrick had used the racket to find a ball, reasoned Elizabeth, perhaps something had distracted him. A school bell, even. He might have placed the racket on the ground, rushed off to lessons, and then forgotten where he had left it. Well, it was a faint possibility. She started to comb through the bushes diligently. There was still no sign of it. She came out of the shrubbery, sucking her hand where the holly had pricked her. She stared across the school field towards the tennis courts. The team from Woodville School had arrived. They were filing onto the court, carrying their tennis rackets. The fifteen minutes was up. She saw Patrick in his tennis whites. He was waiting by the entrance to the tennis courts. He was staring at the ground, the picture of dejection. Elizabeth's heart went out to him. She could hear Julian shouting from a window somewhere. It's no use, Patrick. We can't find it. I'll bring my racket out for you. I'm just coming. Elizabeth slowly began to circle the school buildings, rather than go across to watch the match. Her eyes searched out every nook and cranny. This was beginning to look very suspicious. I was cross with Patrick for talking to me like that. She thought. But in one way, he was right. Somebody has played a horrid joke on him. Somebody's taken his racket and hidden it somewhere. It's the only explanation. Otherwise, surely one of us would have found it by now. Oh, poor Patrick! If only she could find it for him. Thought Elizabeth urgently. Her eyes scanned the big yard at the back of the school kitchens. It was out of bounds, but she crept in and searched around. Even peering into some of the dustbins, where would somebody hide a tennis racket? Not in a dustbin, surely. She was being silly. Where else? She walked through the yard and out into the back drive. She was standing by some parked cars. The Woodville minibus was parked round here too. There were garages beyond, most of them open. That might be a good place to hide a tennis racket, decided Elizabeth. In one of the teachers' garages, no one would dream of looking in there. Besides, we're not allowed round here. Should she go and search them? The situation was desperate. She looked left and right. There was nobody about. She started to tiptoe past the back of the nearest car. It was Miss Best's car, a rather old-fashioned blue saloon with shining paintwork and chrome. Miss Best's car always looked immaculate. That's funny. She hasn't closed her boot properly. Elizabeth realised it was open several inches. She found it hard to imagine the joint headmistress being so careless. She would be leaving the car lights on next. I'd better close it for her. The little girl took hold of the chrome handle and tried to close the lid of the boot. It would not shut. There was something in the way. She opened the boot wider to see what the obstruction was. It was a tennis racket. She pulled it out and looked at it in amazement. It's Patrick's! She gasped. How extraordinary! Somebody had tried to hide it in the boot of Miss Best's car. Well, they haven't succeeded. She realised joyfully. Elizabeth slammed shut the boot. The noise brought Cook to the back door. What's Elizabeth doing here? She wondered. I hope she's not being the naughtiest girl again. But Elizabeth had fled, with Patrick's racket in her hand. She ran all the way to the tennis courts, her heart beating fast with excitement and triumph. Patrick and his partner were at the far end of the first court, having a few practice strokes against the opposing pair from Woodville School. The match was due to start in two minutes' time. Patrick looked a picture of misery as he fluffed a stroke with the borrowed racket. He was by now totally convinced that Elizabeth had hidden his own. Then he heard her voice, "Patrick!" she shouted through the wire netting. 
She was jumping up and down, waving the racket. I found it. He raced off the court and came to meet her at the gate. Everybody was watching them. Oh, Patrick, isn't it lucky that I found it in the nick of time? She began with a bright smile. Very funny, ha ha! What a coincidence! He hissed angrily. He flung Julian's racket down at her feet and snatched his own. His face was like a thunder cloud. The last few minutes had been the most miserable of his life. They had been almost unendurable. It's not amusing, Elizabeth. He mouthed at her. I think you're beastly. I think this is the meanest trick I've ever come across. Elizabeth recoiled. She was speechless. At that moment, atop the high green umpire's chair, Mr. Warlow clapped his hands loudly. Time, please, he called. Woodville won the toss and have chosen to serve. Back on court, Patrick, please. Let the match begin. Elizabeth slowly picked up Julian's racket and walked over to join the other first formers. Belinda and Kathleen had saved her a place on the big grassy bank that overlooked the courts. They sat her on the back. So did Julian. He took possession of his racket with a wry smile. I don't think I'll lend it to him again in a hurry. Wherever did you find it? Whispered Kathleen. In the boot of Miss Best's car, replied Elizabeth dully. Belinda giggled out loud. The beast's car boot? I don't believe it. Sitting just in front of them, Arabella turned her fair head scornfully. Don't tell fibs, Elizabeth Allen. But it was in the boot of Miss Best's car. Elizabeth hissed fiercely. It was. It was. I looked inside, and there it was. You just happened to be passing the beast's car and decided to look inside the boot. Asked Rosemary in disbelief. She was sitting next to Arabella. You must have known it was there. You must have, seeing you'd hidden it there yourself. Suggested Arabella. She spoke primly. I think it was really mean to play a trick, and it's even meaner to pretend you didn't. Now you feel scared. Now you see how serious it was. You had half the school looking for that racket. If Patrick plays badly, it will be your fault, Elizabeth. How. Dare you say that? Gasped Elizabeth. Please be quiet, children," said Miss Ranger, their class teacher, who had just arrived to watch the match. "You must not talk while play is in progress." Arabella studiously turned her well-groomed head away from Elizabeth, and focused all her attention on the game. She clapped loudly every time Patrick won a point. Far from playing badly, Patrick played a brilliant match. With his precious racket safely back in his hands, all his confidence returned. But there was something else. He was fired up with anger at the joke that he believed had been played on him. He turned all that anger into hard, fierce strokes, beating the pair on the other side of the net time after time. He would show Elizabeth Allen a thing or two. She would see what a fine player he was, not someone only fit to have tricks played upon them. Elizabeth hardly noticed how well Patrick was doing, for it was her turn to feel miserable now. She sat through the match in a blur. She was seething with anger towards Patrick. For Arabella, with her sarcastic comments, she had only contempt. Soon the match was over. Whiteleaf's second pair had won by two sets to love. On the court, Patrick was elated. Eileen, his partner, was handing round one of the school biscuit tins. She was hospitality monitor for the day. At Whiteleaf, a different person was chosen to be hospitality monitor at every match. They were given the job of baking sweets or biscuits or little cakes in the days before the match to offer to all the players afterwards. Patrick was tucking into Eileen's fudge with relish. He glimpsed the forlorn figure sitting on the bank. For the first time, he wondered if he could possibly have misjudged Elizabeth. It would be terrible if her find had been genuine. He must ask the others about it. A cheer suddenly went up. Whiteleaf's first team pair had won their match as well. Eileen quickly hurried over with the tin to offer more fudge around. Both matches were over. Whiteleaf had won the fixture. The news about Patrick's racket had quickly spread. Arabella was claiming that Elizabeth must be telling stories. 
She was pretending she had found the racket in the beast's car boot. It was all too far-fetched. Elizabeth had been sulky after Patrick teased her about not being a monitor. She must have decided to get her own back, more likely. The whole thing had got out of hand, so now she was trying to wriggle out of it. Noting the funny looks, Elizabeth's anger deepened. Don't worry, we believe you, said Kathleen sweetly. But Elizabeth was scrambling to her feet. She had no intention of sitting round watching Arabella stir up mischief. She was even talking to Patrick now, as he came off court. She thought of the tremendous effort she had made to find his tennis racket for him. She had pricked herself. It was outrageous. She strode away, heading back to school. Julian caught up with her by the main doors. He grasped her arm. Elizabeth, he grinned. Don't get in a huff. You must admit it sounds a tall story about the car boot. If you and I weren't such good friends, I'm not sure I'd believe you myself. Thanks. You know what Arabella's like. I don't know why she has to stir things up so. He said, becoming serious for once. I'm not sure anyone's taking us seriously. Some of them are, only the silly ones. Patrick thinks I hid his racket. He will be quite sure of it now. Well, then he's silly too. What a chap to have as a cousin! He's an embarrassment sometimes. I'm beginning to wish all over again that he'd never come to Whiteleaf. I was beginning to enjoy myself. I hate him! Exclaimed Elizabeth. Julian let go of Elizabeth's arm, put his hands in his pockets, and frowned to himself. He turned over a small stone with the toe of his shoe. Then he looked her in the eye. The simple fact is, Elizabeth. That as you did not hide Patrick's racket in the boot of the beast's car, somebody else did. But who, and why? I think we should go straight round to the car and have a hunt around. We need to look for clues. I can't be bothered," said Elizabeth sulkily. "If someone hates Patrick, it's no more than he deserves. Why should I care? Except it would put you in the clear," said Julian calmly. I am in the clear," exclaimed Elizabeth. "I don't have to prove myself to people like Arabella and Patrick. My real friends know I wouldn't play such a silly, mean trick, and that's good enough for me." At that moment, some first formers appeared. Arabella amongst them. Elizabeth turned her back on them and walked away. She was tired of all this. She did not particularly want to see the rest of her classmates at the moment. Let them chatter away amongst themselves as much as they wished. She would go and do some gardening and enjoy some peace and quiet. She would go to the school gardens and find her dear John Terry and ask him to give her some jobs to do. But when she got there, there was no sign of him anywhere. Chapter Six. Julian looks for clues. Elizabeth was puzzled. She had never known John to be anywhere else but the school gardens on a fine Saturday afternoon, as well as the vegetable gardens. She looked for him in all the usual places: the greenhouses, the tool shed, the potting shed, and round by the compost heap. He was nowhere to be found. After looking for him all over, she took a glance at his prize lettuces. They had grown some more and were hearting out nicely. She walked down the two rows, checking the bowls of milk. A few slugs had become trapped in them, but there was plenty of room for more. At present, the soil having dried out well, the slimy black creatures had gone to ground. It would need another spell of wet weather to bring them out again in force. At the end of one row, a single dandelion was growing rather closer than it should to a cos lettuce. Elizabeth bent down to pull it out, then suddenly remembered. She straightened up quickly. She had almost forgotten. She must do nothing to help John's plants before the competition for the cup in two weeks' time. No, not even pull out a single weed. It was against the rules. She was proud to be the only person in the whole school who knew John's exciting secret. Peter, Sophie, have you seen John? She called as two junior class pupils appeared, carrying little forks and trowels. No, replied Peter. 
Thomas is in charge today. We're going to help put new straw round the tomato plants," explained Sophie. "The old straw got all wet, but first we're going to weed round the peas." The senior boy appeared then with the wheelbarrow laden with straw. "That's the trouble when it's been wet," laughed Thomas. "It brings on the weeds faster than the things you're really trying to grow, don't you think, Elizabeth?" "Yes." Not to mention slugs and snails and other undesirables, Elizabeth thought. But Thomas, what's happened to John today? I've been looking for him everywhere. Haven't you heard? The big boy stood the wheelbarrow down and walked over to her. He's stuck away in the sand, poor chap. He's got German measles or scarlatina or something. I've forgotten what, but it's very infectious. He's in a room on his own. Nobody's allowed to go anywhere near him in case the whole school catches it. Oh, poor John! Elizabeth gasped. It's all right. It's nothing serious. He'll be completely better in a week or ten days. Then Matron will let him out. Elizabeth digested the dramatic news. She remembered how tired John had looked the other evening. It must have been because the illness was coming on. Until he's let out of San, I'm in charge of the school gardens," said Thomas proudly. "And by the way, John gave Matron a message to give me: nobody is to go near his private patch or touch any of his plants. Strictly forbidden." Elizabeth nodded. She knew the reason for that. Her mind had already turned back to John's lettuces. She glanced at the sky, feeling anxious. A week or ten days—that was such a long time. Supposing it got very wet again, and more slugs appeared and needed to be attended to, or supposing there was a heat wave with long hot days and the plants became parched and needed to be watered, it did not bear thinking about. Have you come down to help? Thomas was asking. Would you like to weed some peas with Sophie and Peter? Oh, please come and help us, Elizabeth," said Sophie, running over and taking her hand. "Look how many weeds have grown." Elizabeth smiled. "I'll enjoy that, Sophie." After an hour's gardening, Elizabeth felt much better. There was something deeply relaxing about working with the soil in the gentle sunshine, the sights and sounds and smells of nature all around. It was impossible to feel anxious for long, as one listened to the doves cooing in the dovecot, the bees buzzing round the wallflowers. The following day at breakfast, she was pleased to see through the windows that it was another mild day. Would the weather continue like this for the next ten days? With gentle sunshine and just the occasional sharp shower, John's plants would be perfectly safe. Nature would take care of them for him while he was locked away in the sand. That afternoon, she went out riding with Julian again. I did go and look for clues yesterday, Elizabeth," he told her airily. After you went off, I wandered over and had a good hunt round the beast's car. They both reined in their ponies. Oh, did you find anything? Just this old crisp packet blowing about under the car. He produced a crumpled bag from the pocket of his jeans. It had stars and stripes on it, and a picture of Uncle Sam. It's an American brand, Southern Favorites. Never heard of them, have you? Elizabeth glanced at the packet and shook her head. It could have blown over from the school dustbins. It doesn't mean anything. True, agreed Julian. He grinned. I've had a thought, though. Do you think the culprit could have been Roger Brown, trying to upset Patrick? So he could get his place in the second team back. Elizabeth frowned and thought about the big, gentle senior boy. She simply could not imagine him creeping around and hiding Patrick's racket. Impossible, she replied. They looked at each other ruefully. In any case, Elizabeth laughed. I'm not sure I care. The fact was that Elizabeth and Julian's cousin were no longer on speaking terms. They had simply decided to ignore each other. At the dinner table today, Patrick had been rather full of himself. There was to be another home match next weekend. Whiteleaf would be playing St Faith's, and Patrick had been picked for the second team again. After his good performance against Woodville, his place was beginning to look very secure. 
and Mr. Warlow has asked me to be hospitality monitor, Patrick told Martin, as a reward for playing so well. Isn't that an honour? You were brilliant, said Martin, who was now a great admirer. It will be quite a tough match, said Patrick, but the really big match will be the one after that, just before half term. You mean the match against Hickling Green? said Rosemary, knowledgeably. Whiteley versus Hickling Green was always the big tennis fixture of the summer term. The two schools were long standing rivals. Yes, nodded Patrick. A lot of parents come to watch. If they're collecting us at half term, I've got to play well against St. Faith's to make sure of my place for the big match. I'm sure you will, Patrick, cooed Arabella. Especially now you're keeping your racket safely locked up. Nobody else at the table had taken part in this conversation. Unofficially, the class was starting to divide into two factions. There was a very small faction consisting of Patrick, Arabella, Rosemary, and Martin. These four, together with one or two hangers on, firmly believed that Elizabeth had played a mean trick on Patrick and was refusing to own up. She had not once been called the naughtiest girl in the school for nothing. A much bigger faction, consisting of Julian, Belinda, Kathleen, and many others, sided firmly with Elizabeth. They felt sure that if by any chance Elizabeth had played a joke, as a former monitor, and such a fine one, she would certainly have owned up. As a matter of fact, Julian, Elizabeth said now, as they turned their ponies to head back to school, I really do not care. I mean, even if it was Roger wanting to get his place back in the second team, he deserves it more than Patrick does. He's much more decent than Patrick. Yes. Julian's green eyes twinkled. His friend was being illogical. Of course. And much too decent to have played such a trick in the first place. Well, Elizabeth, he added airily, if you don't care, then why should I? There the conversation ended. They trotted briskly back to the school stables. After seeing to the pony, Elizabeth decided to wander down to the school gardens. She had a compulsion to keep an eye on John's project. I must just check that the plants are all right, she thought, even though there's nothing at all I can do about it if they're not. The prize lettuces looked as fine as ever. No more slugs had appeared. The few in the bowls remained thoroughly bloated and drowned looking. I suppose there's no chance that they can somehow revive, Elizabeth fussed to herself. It would be awful if they're just unconscious and could come back to life again. She walked round to the small rubbish heap where John had dumped all the dead creatures before. There was quite a mound of them. She turned them over with a twig, one by one, examining each one carefully. At first she screwed up her nose, but she soon got used to them. Poor fat things. Yes, they're dead all right, she thought. They're as dead as doornails. So the milk idea really, really works. Ugh! came a voice at her shoulder. Elizabeth sprang to her feet guiltily. She turned round. Sophie was standing right behind her. The child's eyes were round as saucers. Why are you playing with those dead slugs, Elizabeth? she asked with a shudder. Elizabeth hurriedly threw the twig away and laughed. It's my secret hobby, Sophie, she joked. I like playing with dead slugs. Do you really? asked the child solemnly. She had been watching for some time. Look here, Sophie, said Elizabeth briskly. She took her firmly by the hand. You know you're not allowed to come wandering down here on your own. I just wanted to look at the flowers again. They do smell lovely. Well, you're coming back to school with me right now. Sophie was reluctant to leave the flowers. Elizabeth decided to cheer her up. I'll teach you a funny song, she said kindly. It's one my governess told me. You can make up any names you like to put in it. Soon they were chanting it together, all the way back to school. What is little Sophie made of? What is little Sophie made of? Sugar and spice and all things nice. That's what little Sophie is made of. 
What is little Patrick made of? What is little Patrick made of? Slugs and snails and puppy dogs' tails. That's what little Patrick is made of. At the main doors, they parted with peals of laughter. Sophie liked the song; she would use it for skipping. Elizabeth felt cheerful too. She loved being at Whiteleaf School, in spite of the fact that she was no longer a monitor. She and Julian had been for such a good ride, and John's lettuces were looking fine. They were looking better than ever. But the next day, the rains came back. Chapter Seven. Elizabeth makes up her mind. Will you please be so kind as to stop staring at me, Elizabeth? Requested Mademoiselle during French, the first lesson on Monday morning. Will you be so kind as to keep your eyes down and fixed on your work? Do you not know it is very rude to stare? What is the matter with you this morning? Is it that you have never before seen a person eating a biscuit? From the rest of the class, there came muffled giggles as the boys and girls glanced up from their vocabulary sheets. Sorry, Mamselle, Elizabeth apologized. I wasn't really staring at you. I was thinking about something else. You will think about your French vocabulary while you are sitting in my lesson, if you please, Elizabeth. Elizabeth lowered her head obediently. She pored studiously over her word sheet. Mamselle had given them ten minutes to learn some vocabulary, while she herself marked some second form essays over by the big window. Then there would be a test. Elizabeth had not even noticed that Mamselle was eating a biscuit. It was such a commonplace. The temperamental French teacher carried her school biscuit tin everywhere, full of cook's homemade oatmeal biscuits. She needed them, she had explained to Miss Bell and Miss Best. To counteract the nervous dyspepsia she suffered when taking lessons, it helped to keep her digestive system calm. Everybody knew that, so naturally, first thing on Monday morning, out had come the biscuit tin. I wish they would keep the rest of her calm. Elizabeth sighed to herself. She was embarrassed to have received a scolding in front of the whole class. The little girl had been staring not at Mamselle, but at the window panes beyond. There were large raindrops splattering onto them, drip drop, drip drop. They were getting louder and larger by the minute. Elizabeth had found it difficult not to watch the rain. Was this just the beginning, or would it soon stop? The rain did not stop; it poured down relentlessly until the middle of the afternoon. This will bring the slugs out again for sure, Elizabeth thought in despair. And with none of us able to do a thing about it, she now felt deeply anxious about John's project once again. The glimmerings of a plan began to form in the back of her mind. After tea that day, when the rain had stopped, she walked down to the village with her friend Joan. The children were only allowed to go to the village in pairs. What are you going to buy at the shops today, Elizabeth? Asked the second former. I'm going to get some sweets for John Terry," she replied. She still had fifty pence left, even after paying Belinda back for some stamps she had borrowed. She had been planning to save the fifty pence, but this was more important. John must be so miserable on his own in the sand day after day. "You are a very kind person, Elizabeth," said Joan quietly, linking arms with her best friend as they walked along. "Susan thinks so too." Susan, yes, William and Rita told her how you stood down as an honorary monitor, so that she could have a proper turn. I was so proud of you when I heard that. You were being such a fine monitor. Elizabeth felt noble again. Then she suddenly blushed. Oh, Elizabeth, you've gone all red," laughed Joan. "I didn't mean to embarrass you. It's not that," confessed Elizabeth. The fact is, I'm quite pleased I'm not a monitor at the moment. I'm planning to do something rather unmonitorish. I wish I could explain to you, but I can't. It's to do with somebody else's secret, you see. Try not to get into any scrapes, then. But I am sure you will have a good reason for whatever it is you're planning to do. I have 
I've got a good reason, Elizabeth told herself an hour later, as she crept through the grounds towards the school sanatorium. John's sweets were in her hand. I only hope his room is one of the ground floor ones, and I only hope Matron doesn't see me. Unluckily for Elizabeth, the very first window she peered through found her looking straight into Matron's face. Matron was sitting at her desk in her office, and she looked up in surprise when she heard a rustle of bushes. Then she saw Elizabeth's face at the window. She quickly opened the window wide and leaned out. Goodness gracious, Elizabeth Allen, you gave me such a scare, she exclaimed. What are you doing, creeping round here like a burglar? Elizabeth was mortified. I wanted to give John a wave through his window, but I didn't know which room, she said hurriedly. I was going to wave these sweets at him to cheer him up. I went and bought them for him after tea. You won't be waving through any window at John for a while, you silly girl. He's upstairs, and he's tucked up in bed fast asleep. He has to stay in complete isolation, you know, Elizabeth, just until the rash has gone and his temperature's back to normal. However, Matron took the sweets for him. Before closing the window on Elizabeth, she spoke much more gently. Everybody knows John's in quarantine, but you've got a good heart. It will cheer him up to know someone's come over with some sweets. He's been a real misery today, I can tell you. Fussing on about the rain and his blessed garden. A drop of rain, I ask you. It must be the fever, I expect. Elizabeth slipped away, feeling worse than ever. Her plan had come to nothing. Poor John. She had been so hoping that she might get the chance to talk to him through the window. To tell him, she thought that the competition rules were plain silly now, and he must be prepared to let her help him a little bit. But she had been caught by Matron straight away. Her feet began to drag as she struggled with her conscience for a while. It was very difficult to come to a decision. But it was the thought of John lying on his sickbed, fretting and unhappy, that finally persuaded her. John's so great, I've got to help him. The competition rules are silly now. I've got to look after his plants for him now, without his knowing, and without anybody else knowing either. Nobody need ever know, not even John himself, she realised. All that will happen is he'll still win the special cup for the school, just as he's always hoped. Elizabeth broke into a run. Her mind made up, there was no time to lose. Recklessly, she ran immediately across to the school kitchens and found Cook. A jug of milk, Elizabeth? Whatever do you want a whole jug full for? Oh, drat, thought Elizabeth. Then, looking through the side windows, she saw Fluff, the school cat, sitting outside on the low wall. I think Fluff looks thirsty, she said, not untruthfully. Fluff always looks thirsty, laughed Cook. Well, You're not going to give him a whole jugful. I'll pour some in a bowl for you. She found an old bowl under the middle sink and filled it from a jug. Off you go, and when you see Patrick, could you give him a message? Tell him I shall have some more cooking chocolate on Thursday, if he wants to make his crispy cakes then. Elizabeth slipped out of the side door, walked straight past Fluff, and headed for the school gardens. She carried the bowl carefully, for Cook had been generous. She did not notice Fluff stretch, yawn, and decide to follow her. I don't suppose this will be nearly enough, but at least it's a start, thought Elizabeth eagerly. She glanced around, anxious not to be seen. Luckily, the grounds were deserted. In fact, it was getting so late that Elizabeth should have been indoors. This was the time of evening when the first formers were expected to read or play quietly in the common room. I wonder what's happened to Elizabeth, Belinda was saying. I haven't seen her. Perhaps she has a piano lesson, shrugged Julian in his casual way. No, that isn't today, said Kathleen. If you ask me, Arabella intervened, Elizabeth is not exactly sociable these days. It's the shock of not being a monitor any more, I suppose. If we ask you, we will be very interested to hear what you have to say, replied Julian. But as we haven't asked you, we are not. 
Elizabeth tiptoed through the school gardens and found John's vegetable patch. The ground was squelchy. She placed a bowl of milk carefully on the path and went to examine his salad plants. It was such a relief to be doing something positive at last. From the moment she had made the decision to help John in secret, a weight had been lifted from her mind. There was nothing worse than sitting around worrying and feeling helpless. This was going to be much more fun. Half expecting to see the hearty green leaves ravaged by slugs, as her own had been, she was cheered to find them still intact. She smiled as she thought of what Cook had said about Patrick and the cooking chocolate. Patrick had been going around saying it was sissy to have to make sweets or something, just because he was to be hospitality monitor at the St. Faith's match on Saturday. A girl ought to make them and let him have the honour of handing them round. Even Arabella had drawn the line at that. In that case, he boasted, he would get hold of some of those biscuits like Mamselle's. But secretly, he was making something after all. Well, it would be difficult for her to give him the message. They were still not speaking. She would have to ask one of the others to tell him. Elizabeth's mind turned back to the slug situation. Looking in the six bowls, one by one, she found that a lot more slugs were now trapped in them. The soil was very wet after today's rain, and this had brought them out again. Two of the bowls are nearly full, she realised, although the other four are all right. How lucky that she had got some milk from Cook straight away. There would be just enough to sort out the nearly full bowls. Screwing up her nose, she carried them both over to the little rubbish pile and tipped them out onto the waiting slug mound. That was goodbye to some more fat slugs. She came back, bent down and replaced the empty bowls in position. Now to get the milk and tip half in each, she thought. Then she stopped. As she had straightened up, she had felt something rubbing against her legs. There came a loud purring sound. She looked down. Fluff! she exclaimed. Then she saw the traces of milk on his mouth and whiskers. Oh no! squealed Elizabeth. She ran over to find her milk. The bowl was empty. The big cat with a fluffy face had drunk every last drop. Elizabeth trudged back to the school kitchens with the empty bowl, feeling a sense of despair. Why did things have to go wrong? She had tried to help John, but in fact she had made matters worse. There had been six working slug traps, and now there were only four. She had put two of them out of action. As those two bowls were now empty... The creatures would just ignore them. The four remaining bowls would not suffice very much longer. Given more rain, John's lettuces would soon be getting devoured. Oh, what should she do now? The kitchens were deserted. Cook and her helpers had finished for the day. All the washing up had been done, the floor swabbed down. Elizabeth crept over to the middle sink, carefully washed and dried the old bowl, then replaced it in the cupboard below. About to leave, she noticed that someone had carelessly left the pantry door ajar. She walked over to close it. It was a beautifully cool room, with a stone-flagged floor and marble shelves. Staring inside, Elizabeth glimpsed a long row of large jugs, each with a little square of muslin draped over the top. On an impulse, she slipped in and peered inside the nearest jug. It was full of milk. They all were. It was the milk for the children's breakfast cereal. As it was cool this evening, one of Cook's helpers had set them up in readiness for the morning. Tons and tons of milk, realised Elizabeth. She picked up the near jug. It was quite heavy. Oh, nobody would ever miss one jug, would they? Not just one. It was a reckless thing to do. It was very hot-headed of Elizabeth. She left with the jug, stealing along the corridors as quickly as she could without spilling the milk inside. She would hide the big jug in her bedside locker. As she turned a corner, she paused. The common room door was wide open, and she would have to pass it before she could get up the stairs. The only thing she could do was to make a dash for it. Elizabeth! her friends cried as she flashed by. 
they crowded to the door, only to see her back view disappearing upstairs. Aren't you coming in? they shouted. I'm sleepy. I'm going to bed, came the muffled reply. A minute later, she was on her knees in the dormitory by her bedside locker. She cleared a space for the jug of milk, placed it inside, then closed the cupboard door. Nobody ever looked in people's lockers. They were private. To get her breath back, she flung herself on the bed and lay staring at the ceiling. What have I done? she thought, feeling surprised at herself. Well, there's no going back now. Slowly, very slowly, a feeling of relief crept over her. It could rain as much as it liked this week. The slugs could come marching out if they wanted to. She had plenty of ammunition now. She would be ready for them. But as so often happens in the scheme of things, there was no more heavy rain that week. The ground dried out nicely. Weather conditions for growing prize lettuce turned out to be quite perfect. Elizabeth continued to keep a watchful eye on them and was thankful. Great secrecy and stealth would have been required to help them along. Roger, no longer in the tennis team, was always working in the gardens these fine evenings, as was Thomas. The large jug of milk remained hidden in her locker, untouched, and in time forgotten. So when a second former stood up at the next school meeting, her words gave Elizabeth a shock. Please, I have a complaint. On Tuesday morning, when our table went up to collect our jug of milk, there was none left. Cook said staff always fill the right number of jugs, so one table must have been greedy and taken two. We had to share a jug with the next table, and we all had a measly amount of milk on our cornflakes. I think the table that took two jugs of milk ought to own up. William and Rita, as judges, looked around the crowded hall. Did any table help themselves to an extra jug of milk on Tuesday morning? asked Rita pleasantly. If so, would they please own up now? There was silence. The head boy and girl waited patiently for a few moments. There were rows of blank faces. It was obvious that no one was going to stand up. At a nod from Rita, William looked relieved and banged the gavel on the little table. Very well, he announced with a smile. I think on this occasion we can be quite sure that one of the kitchen staff did make a little mistake. None of us is perfect. You must put the matter behind you, Chloe, and not be the last table to collect its milk next time. The whole school laughed. Elizabeth felt very hot. As soon as the meeting ended, she had to rush outside and gulp in some fresh air. She had never in her life not owned up to something before. She felt terribly guilty. But how could she explain to the meeting about the missing jug of milk without giving John's secret away? She went for a walk in the grounds to calm herself down. Meanwhile, In the dormitory she shared with some of the other girls, a mystery was being investigated. I've noticed a funny smell for days, said Jenny, but it's suddenly much worse. It's really bad today. It seems to be coming from Elizabeth's locker, exclaimed Belinda, sniffing around. Do you think we ought to look inside? I'm sure she wouldn't mind. When Elizabeth entered the dormitory, she found a crowd of girls waiting for her. Belinda was holding a large, empty milk jug in her hands. She had washed all the sour milk down the sink. So someone did take a jug of milk after all, said Jenny. And it was you, Elizabeth. What did you take it for? You're all gone sour. You hadn't even drunk any. Elizabeth just stared at the empty jug in dismay and said nothing. Why didn't you own up at the meeting? asked Kathleen, looking upset. We've stuck by you all this time, Elizabeth, exclaimed Belinda, who felt betrayed. But is it true what some people have been saying? That you do things and don't own up to them? That you can't be bothered to be good now you're not a monitor any more? Please explain, begged Kathleen. I can't explain, Kathleen, Elizabeth blurted out. I just can't. Rosemary was standing in the doorway listening. Arabella has been right about you all along, she said smugly. 
Elizabeth rushed past her and away down the corridor. She was feeling confused and upset. She had done something wrong. Now she had been found out. Even Belinda and Kathleen and Jenny were starting to turn against her, but she had only been trying to keep a secret. She was thankful that the weekend lay ahead, and she would not have to face the whole class again before Monday. She would spend some time with Joan. First, in the morning, she would have a private talk with Julian. Chapter Eight: A Private Letter Arrives. Julian was full of good advice the next morning. "You're in a tight corner, Elizabeth, all because of this silly secret," he said. "Whatever is it? Has someone been asking you to make them some cheese? You can't keep that secret for long. It makes such a pong." His green eyes were laughing and full of mischief. Everything happened to Elizabeth. "Of course not," she replied. "And if they were, I wouldn't be able to tell you." But it's something much more important than that, and I've crossed my heart and sworn to die. I know that, and so you can't go and confess to William and Rita, which is what the whole class expects you to do," smiled Julian Riley. "Even if you could confess, it wouldn't help much. The damage is done." "I know," nodded Elizabeth. "Now everybody thinks that I played that trick on Patrick." That I hid his racket and was scared to own up about that as well. That's the thing I can't bear. It's known as giving a dog a bad name," said Julian. He patted her brown curly hair. "Oh, poor bad bold girl! Woof woof." "It's not funny," protested Elizabeth. "I didn't mind it when only two or three people sided with Patrick, but now everyone does." And the way Patrick looked at me this morning, I don't think he was really sure that I hid his racket. It was just Arabella winding him up, but now he's convinced. Isn't it about time we found out who really did? Asked Julian quietly. Yes, agreed Elizabeth. And I'm sorry, Julian. I didn't take it seriously before. I was proud and silly. I was just so cross. That's all. To think I was the one who had gone to all that trouble and found his beastly racket for him, but now I see I do have to put myself in the clear over that. It might even be well nicer for Patrick too," she admitted ruefully. "Oh, poor Patrick!" Julian had very little time for his cousin, but now he looked thoughtful. "Yes, I suppose so. He was pretty upset that you didn't come and watch his tennis trial." Then he must have thought you really disliked him, enough to play a mean trick just before his first match. Not very nice for him. I hadn't really thought about it much from Patrick's point of view," he admitted airily. "Nor me," agreed Elizabeth. She tried to concentrate hard. She thought of the crisp packet Julian had found, Southern favourites. Arabella's parents are in America," she said tentatively. That's why she came to Whitecliff. You don't think it's possible they send her goodies like crisps and things? She never hands them round if they do," frowned Julian. "Besides, where's the motive? We have to find a motive." "Well, maybe to get me into trouble," suggested Elizabeth. "But she could never have planned it that you would find the racket." "Maybe that was just a bonus," sighed Elizabeth. The whole thing seems too imaginative for Arabella," Julian replied rather dryly. "Still, interesting about her parents being in America. I didn't know that. Would you like to search her dormy?" "Yes, this afternoon," nodded Elizabeth. "While she's safely at the match." Elizabeth had already decided not to watch the match against St. Faith this afternoon. She preferred to avoid her classmates at present. It was too horrid. The look she was starting to get. She had arranged to go to the village with Joan instead, but Arabella would be at the match, no doubt, sitting in the front row. The perfect opportunity, agreed Julian, as they walked back to school together. I'll look in her desk as well, said Elizabeth excitedly. What will you do, Julian? I shall be at the tennis match, replied Julian casually, watching points. 
When she returned indoors, Elizabeth found an envelope in her pigeonhole. It was firmly sealed and marked Elizabeth Allen, Private. She ran along to the girls' cloakroom and locked herself in a cubicle. Then she opened the envelope to see what was inside. It was a note from John Terry. He had smuggled it out of the sand with the help of one of the school cleaners. Dear Elizabeth, thanks for the sweets. I am feeling much better and have enjoyed them. I shall be out of my prison in a few more days, just in time for that important thing I am going to do. But I am dead worried. It says on the radio there will be heavy rain from Monday onwards. Please keep a close eye next week. Remember, do not do anything to help them along, or it will break the rules. But I have an important job for you. If they start getting attacked, please dig the very best specimens out of the ground. Wrap them in newspaper and hide them in the potting shed. There is a big, cool cupboard in there on the north-facing wall. Do not let anyone see you, or they will ask questions. Thank you, special helper. Your grateful friend, John. P.S. When you have read this note, destroy it completely. Elizabeth carefully memorized the note. Then, with trembling fingers, she tore it into tiny pieces. Dropped it down the lavatory pan and flushed it clean away. It was so exciting to have received a secret message from John. Now she could only feel grateful that all her efforts to help the plants along had come to nothing. No rules had been broken after all. John would have been angry if he had ever found out. But at last, with the lettuces almost ready to pull, he had given her a very important job to do. He was placing his trust in her to do it well. After that, he would soon be back in charge again. Thank goodness! He would take his prize lettuces to the village show and win the cup and bring honour to the school. She took her place at dinner with her head held high. Patrick and Eileen won their match again, although it was a much closer result than against Woodville the week before. As Patrick proudly handed round his chocolate crispy cakes to the visitors from St. Faith's, Miss Ranger and her class clapped and cheered loudly. "Oh, well done, Patrick!" shouted Arabella. She turned to Julian. "Wasn't your cousin marvellous?" "Was he?" asked Julian. He had not been following the rallies closely. He had spent most of the time studying the spectators, watching one face in particular. Elizabeth, meanwhile, had found nothing of interest among Sarabella's things. She had been shocked to see how many clothes and pairs of shoes the spoilt little rich girl had smuggled back to school this term, even though it was against the rules. They were hidden under her bed, but of packets of American crisps, or indeed anything American, there was no sign. I'd feel rather sorry for her if I didn't dislike her so much," thought Elizabeth. Her search is completed. She felt guilty for prying now. It must be horrid being the oldest in the class and nearly always coming bottom and having your parents so far away. She went off to meet Joan and go to the village. She was lucky to have such a real and special friend. She decided. Arabella's friend Rosemary was very weak and just toadied to her. Later, she said to Julian. I'm afraid I drew a blank. How about you? I spent most of the match watching Roger Brown's face," replied Julian, "and he looked pretty miserable, even when Patrick and Eileen were winning. It was written all over his face, even when his hands were clapping. Upset to see Patrick playing well again, but that would be only natural," mused Elizabeth. "He must be secretly hoping to get his place in the team back." It's a big match next week against Hickling Green when lots of parents come. He might have wanted to play in that, and now it looks like being Patrick again. I agree," said Julian. "It certainly doesn't prove he's done anything wrong." Neither of them wanted to think that about Roger. All the same," sighed Julian. "I think we should try and keep an eye on him. By Sunday night." Elizabeth remembered there was something else she would need to keep an eye on, this time with John Terry's permission. It had started to rain again. It rained all that night, and when they trailed into French on Monday morning, it was still raining. 
The lettuces have been doing so brilliantly, thought Elizabeth. But there's still time for them to be ruined. I may have to start pulling them by tomorrow. I'll go down and have a look at them after tea today, even if I have to take my umbrella with me. But Elizabeth never got the chance. Something terrible happened in the French lesson that morning, something truly amazing. They were all sitting at their desks, their heads bent over their books, as they copied down a passage from the blackboard. Mamselle quietly opened her biscuit tin and slid her hand inside to pull out her first biscuit of the week. Then, ah! she screamed and dropped the tin. She had pulled out a handful of dead slugs. Chapter 9 The Meeting Decides to Punish Elizabeth. Mamselle leapt to her feet, flinging the slugs away in horror. One hit Arabella on the nose, and she screamed as well. The tin had clattered noisily to the floor, scattering dead slugs everywhere and a few snails too. The classroom door was flung open, and Miss Bell appeared. Whatever's the matter? This is a matter, very, very, very much the matter, cried Mamselle, picking a slug off her skirt and holding it at arm's length between thumb and forefinger. Before letting it drop to the floor with the others, look what horrible things have been put in my tin. There are some very wicked children in this class. They think they make everybody laugh. Some of the class were indeed stuffing their fists in their mouths. The way Arabella had screamed, and Mamselle had looked so funny, holding up the slug like that. One look from Miss Bell quelled their laughter. She was angry. Martin. Go and find a school cleaner to come and clear up this mess at once for Mamselle. The rest of the class sit in silence. After Mamselle returned from washing her hands, Miss Bell gazed at the children for a few moments. Whoever was responsible for that silly trick is to come and own up at dinner time. That will be all. The class was very subdued after that. Elizabeth frowned in deep puzzlement. Wondering how the mound of slugs on John's rubbish heap could have found their way into Mamselle's biscuit tin, was there a practical joker at work? Had the same person hidden Patrick's tennis racket? Well, Roger can't have done this," she whispered to Julian at dinner time. "There's no possible motive." And can you see Arabella dare even look at a slug? I can't," Julian whispered back. He was as puzzled as Elizabeth. Miss Bell, Miss Best, and Mister Johns were puzzled too. Nobody from the first form came to own up as requested. The culprit must be elsewhere. They asked the head boy and girl to call a special meeting. It took place immediately after tea the same day. I hope the culprit owns up quickly," whispered Belinda as they filed into the hall. "I want to play my new record in the common room." I was hoping for a game of tennis, but it's still raining," said Kathleen. "I wonder who managed to get into the kitchens and get their hands on Mamselle's biscuit tin. At least it doesn't seem to have been anybody in our class, unless it was another of Elizabeth's little jokes," said Jenny unhappily, "and she's refusing to own up again." "Oh, I hope not," said Belinda, biting her lip. Of course, the rest of the form, especially Rosemary and Arabella, had been whispering about that possibility all day. Now they waited in keen anticipation to see what would happen at the meeting. Elizabeth was already in the hall, seated next to Julian. Her head was held high. She well knew what some of them were thinking, but she was confident that the truth would come out at the special meeting. She was impatient for it to start. After that, she would get on with the important job of examining John's plants for him. The school monitors were seated on the platform with the head boy and girl. They all looked very serious. So did Miss Bell and Miss Best and Mister Johns, observing from the back of the hall. The entire school was keyed up. A special meeting was a rare event. William banged the little hammer. I hope this matter can be dealt with quickly," he told the assembly. 
He explained, for the benefit of those who did not know, by now very few of them, exactly what had taken place during the first form French lesson. He gazed around the hall, slowly and carefully. The simple fact is that somebody in this hall invented this foolish joke. It is quite unfair that the first form should be the only ones under suspicion. Rita and I, therefore, ask the person responsible to stand up now and own up. The meeting will then decide what their punishment should be. He waited. There was a breathless hush. Will the person please stand up? He repeated. He waited again. Still, there was no movement in the hall. William frowned. Then, quietly, he consulted Rita and all the monitors. A minute later, he came back and banged the gavel to stem the tide of whispering in the hall. Silence, please. As you know, at Whiteleaf School, we do not believe in tale telling. But if the person will not own up, we must get to the bottom of this in some other way. If anybody has any information, if they know anything at all that can shed some light on this, will they please stand up? Arabella could barely restrain herself, thinking of the previous incidents. She glanced at Patrick, but he gave a quick shake of the head and stared at the floor. There then came a sound from the front of the hall. A member of the junior class, who had been sitting cross legged on the floor, was scrambling to her feet. It was Sophie. What do you want to say, Sophie? asked Rita gently. I know where the person must have stolen the dead slugs from. She said importantly, "They must have stolen them from Elizabeth." Elizabeth had a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach. She could hear her classmates giving little gasps. "From Elizabeth?" asked Rita. "She's got a special place where she keeps them in the school garden," explained Sophie. "She likes playing with them sometimes, don't you, Elizabeth?" asked the child in all innocence. At the same time, turning round to look for Elizabeth, you may sit down now, Sophie," said William. "Elizabeth, stand up, please." Elizabeth did so, her cheeks aflame. Even Julian was looking at her in surprise. "Is this true?" asked William. "That you own some dead slugs?" "I don't own them," stated Elizabeth, her voice clear and decisive. "But you know where there are some." You like playing with them. Some of the more senior pupils were snorting and trying not to laugh. I do know where there are some," replied Elizabeth, "but I don't really play with them. I was just messing about to see if they were properly dead." She stopped. If this line of questioning went on much longer, John's secret was bound to come out. Some of us might call that playing with them," commented William. Now the head girl stood up and took over. Elizabeth said, "Rita gently." She was puzzled beyond belief. Please just answer one simple question: yes or no. Did you put some slugs in Mamselle's biscuit tin? No, Rita, I did not," replied Elizabeth in a loud, ringing voice. Somebody else must have found my slugs. That's what must have happened. That was too much for Arabella. She leapt to her feet, "Fibber!" she cried indignantly. "You must have done." "That will do, Arabella," said William firmly. "If you have something to say, please address the whole meeting." Arabella took a deep breath, but before she could compose a little speech, Patrick grabbed her arm. "Shut up and sit down," he hissed. "You haven't any proof." Arabella subsided. Very well then," said William, looking troubled. "The time has come for Rita and I to discuss things with the monitors and to come to a decision." Everybody on the platform went into a huddle. In the hall, the children whispered quietly amongst themselves. Julian gave Elizabeth's arm a squeeze. "Don't they eat snails in France?" he grinned. "Maybe that's why someone played the trick on Mamselle." "So what?" Elizabeth hissed back. She was in no mood for Julian's jokes. She was pent up, waiting to hear what the meeting decided. She could see Joan up on the platform speaking anxiously. 
she was quite sure that her best friend would be sticking up for her. At long last, William returned to the table and banged the gavel. We have reached our decision. The two second form monitors are convinced that whatever quarrels may be going on in the first form, Elizabeth Allen is very honest and has never been afraid to own up to wrongdoing. They know her best, of course, but Rita and I are of the same opinion. We have no evidence that Elizabeth played this trick, and she has stated clearly to the whole meeting that she did not. In due course, we will discover the true culprit, and until then, let their own guilty conscience be their punishment. Elizabeth sighed with relief, proud to be a member of a school like Whiteleaf. But then her relief turned to dismay. Nevertheless, messing around with dead slugs is not something we would expect of a former monitor. It may even have given someone the idea for the trick played on Mamselle this morning. Please stand up again, Elizabeth. We have decided on your punishment. Elizabeth stood up, faced the platform, and awaited her sentence. Until John Terry is released from the sand and is able to supervise you again, you are forbidden from the school gardens. They are strictly out of bounds. That must be clearly understood. Elizabeth nodded and sat down. Her face was very pale. The meeting ended. Sophie was upset. She had not meant to get Elizabeth into trouble. If you ask me, you got off lightly, Elizabeth Allen, scowled Arabella, as they came out of the hall. Who wants to do any gardening in this weather anyway? Yes, what a swizz, echoed Rosemary. Patrick was looking thoughtful. He hurriedly steered Arabella and her friend away from Elizabeth. He badly wanted to have a talk with them. Got off lightly, thought Elizabeth bitterly, as she stood and watched them go. She could have wept with frustration. She had been banned from the school gardens. She would never dare to defy such a ban, given out by the meeting in front of the whole school, however unjust she knew it to be. But it meant that she would be unable to follow John's secret instructions this week. She would be unable to save his prized lettuces for him. All the worry, all the trying to help, all the getting into trouble, it would all have been in vain. The meeting could not have decided on a worse punishment. Chapter 10 Arabella Stirs Up Trouble Again Come on, Rosemary, let's go and talk to Cook, said Arabella the following afternoon. You never know, she might have seen something. Do you really think we should? Of course we should. I don't think Elizabeth should be allowed to get away with playing that trick on Mamselle. Patrick says we haven't got any proof. Well, let us see if we can find some. Arabella was still smarting. Even twenty-four hours later, from the conversation that had taken place with Patrick, the fact was that poor Patrick was rather confused. He had been rather impressed with Elizabeth's bearing at the special meeting, with the clearness and candour of her voice. He was sure she had played that mean trick with his tennis racket. He felt she must dislike him very much to have done that, and the idea made him miserable. But surely Elizabeth did not dislike Mamselle, too. They got on well. Why should she want to play an unkind trick on Mamselle? It did not make sense. At the special meeting, she had seemed to Patrick like someone telling the truth. So could there be an anonymous joker on the loose in the school, somebody with a rather warped sense of humour, who chose their victims at random? To someone like that, putting his racket in the boot of the beast's car could have seemed really amusing. Could it be, reasoned Patrick, that Elizabeth really had found his racket for him in the nick of time that day? The thought chastened him, remembering the bad things he had said to her. On the other hand, he found it strangely cheering. It would mean that Elizabeth did not dislike him after all. What are you suddenly talking about proof for, Patrick? Arabella had asked scornfully. Have you forgotten about the missing jug of milk? She didn't own up about that either, and it was actually found in her locker. 
Patrick had no answer, yet he had still felt uneasy. Let's see what we can find out, Rosemary, said Arabella now. She felt excited as they walked over to the school kitchens together. She had discovered that Mamzelle always left her empty biscuit tin with Cook at weekends to be replenished for the new week ahead. Elizabeth could have got into the kitchens over the weekend and put her slugs inside the tin and shut the lid firmly. Then Mamzelle could have come to collect her tin soon after, picked up the tin, felt it was heavy, and thought her biscuits were inside. Come to think of it, frowned Arabella. I wonder what happened to the biscuits. That's one of the things we can ask," said Rosemary, who was not quite following all this. Cook was on tea break, but one of the kitchen helpers, Molly, was there. No, I didn't see nobody suspicious. Not over the weekend," she said blankly. Then Rosemary asked if she had seen any of Mamselle's special oatmeal biscuits lying around anywhere. Well, isn't it funny you should ask that? Replied Molly, looking unhappy. I found them all dumped in the waste bin on Saturday afternoon. I don't think Mamselle could have liked the look of them this week. Very wasteful, I thought it was. In the waste bin. Are you sure you didn't see somebody from our form in here on Saturday? Begged Arabella. Some time earlier, before it was time for Mamselle to come to collect her tin. Think hard, Molly. Well, only Patrick, of course," said Molly. He came in to collect the tennis tin. He had made some nice chocolate crispy cakes for the tennis match. It was stood on the table next to Mamselle's. I nearly gave him the wrong one. It's a blue tin, you see, very like hers. Arabella gasped out loud. Two blue tins, of course. Thank you, Molly," she said. "You've been most helpful." If they didn't take all our money away from us at this school, I would give you a small gift. Then, grabbing Rosemary by the hand, she hurried out of the kitchens. Where are we going, Arabella? To find Patrick, of course! Cried Arabella triumphantly. The rain had stopped for a while. They found Patrick by the south wall, practicing his tennis strokes. Arabella was careful not to show her true feelings. Patrick. I am afraid I've got some rather unpleasant news," she said sorrowfully. She told him about the inquiries they had made in the school kitchens. So I'm afraid the slugs weren't meant for Mamzelle at all, Patrick," she said, her eyes cast down demurely. The person dumped the biscuits and replaced them with slugs because they thought it was the tennis tin. They were playing a mean trick on you again, Patrick. Nobody would dare play a trick like that on Mamzelle. Patrick's face turned pale as the words sunk in. A vivid picture of how it would have been came to his mind's eye. He, the hospitality monitor, proudly opening the blue tin, proudly offering round to the visiting team from St Faith's the dead slugs. Elizabeth, sitting on the bank, waiting eagerly for this moment, convulsed with laughter when she saw him humiliated. So Elizabeth really did dislike him then. How he had fooled himself! The sense of disappointment turned to a sudden rush of blind anger. And nobody will dare play a trick like that on me again either. He raged. Especially not Elizabeth Allen. Just wait till I find her. He pushed the two girls aside almost rudely, and went racing round to the front of the school. Rosemary felt a twinge of anxiety. What was going to happen now? It was very unfortunate. Elizabeth was standing at the top of some steps outside the main doors. She was standing on one leg like a stork, staring into space and thinking about John's lettuces. They were probably being chewed up right now, one by one, and there was nothing she could do. Patrick came round the corner of the building, saw Elizabeth, then charged towards the steps with his head down like an angry bull. He almost cannoned into Mr. Johns on the way. He came bounding up the steps towards Elizabeth, shouting wildly and waving his arms. Those slugs and snails were meant for me, weren't they, Elizabeth? You wanted to make me look an idiot. You wanted to get me into trouble. 
His flailing arms caught Elizabeth's right elbow, and she overbalanced. With a cry of surprise, she found herself slithering all the way down the steps, to crash face downwards into a big muddy puddle at the bottom. She lay there, winded, gasping for breath. Whatever was the matter with Patrick? It had all been a dreadful shock. Miss Ranger came running over. Both she and Mister Johns helped the girl to her feet. Elizabeth was covered in mud from head to toe. She was clearly shaken, and tears were running down both cheeks. Gently, Miss Ranger took hold of her hand. Patrick stood frozen at the top of the steps, staring down at the scene in dismay. "I'll see Elizabeth gets a hot bath and some fresh clothes," said Miss Ranger. "Oh, poor Elizabeth!" "And I will deal with the boy," said Mister Johns angrily. "Patrick Holland, stay right where you are. I'm going to have a word with you." As Elizabeth, still shaken and upset, was led indoors by her class teacher, the senior master spoke sternly to Patrick. We do not tolerate this sort of behaviour at Whiteleaf. I didn't push her, sir. It was an accident. Yes, because your temper was completely out of control," replied Mr. Johns. "You behaved like a ruffian." I had good reason to lose my temper," protested Patrick. "I've just found out something. Elizabeth tried to do something extremely bad to me." Mr. Johns cut him short. You will report to the head boy and girl's study in one hour's time," he said. "You may put your side of the story then. They will be very fair, but I shall be very surprised if you go unpunished, Patrick. Whatever the provocation, until you are called, please go and wait in your common room. Over the next hour, as he paced up and down the first form common room, Patrick gradually began to feel calmer. His classmates had heard about the incident on the school steps. At Matron's insistence, Elizabeth herself had been sent to bed after her hot bath. Luckily, she was unhurt, not even a bruise. But it was felt she should rest, have an early night. Now, as his classmates heard about the two blue biscuit tins, and how Elizabeth must have mistaken Mamselle's tin for the tennis tin, they began to understand why Patrick had lost his temper. I'm sure William and Rita will understand too," thought Patrick. "I don't like telling tales, but I will have to explain it all to them. They will see what Elizabeth has been putting me through. It is hateful the way she can dislike me so much." However, on his way to their study, he heard running footsteps behind him. "Patrick," puffed Kathleen, catching up with him. "Wait, I've only just heard about it all, and what you intend to say to William and Rita." But you can't. It's rubbish. Elizabeth could not have thought the oatmeal biscuits were the goodies for the tennis match. She could never have made that mistake. She knew you had made some chocolate crispy cakes. How could she know? Asked Patrick. I kept it a secret. And besides, we are not even on speaking terms. I know you're not. That's why, when Cook gave her a message to give you about the cooking chocolate. She asked me to give you the message instead, to pretend that Cook had asked me to tell you. Elizabeth would never have put the slugs in the wrong tin. Either somebody from another form did it, or the trick was meant for Mamselle after all. Patrick's mouth fell open now. Thanks, Kathleen. He croaked. Thanks for telling me this. He walked into the head boy and girl's study in a bemused state. When asked to put his side of the story. He could only mumble in embarrassment. It was just a misunderstanding. I thought Elizabeth had done something to me, but she hadn't. It was wrong of me to lose my temper. You must learn to control it in future, Patrick. You must learn the hard way. At breakfast the following morning, everyone at Elizabeth's table was very subdued. They had all heard the upsetting news. Patrick had lost his place in the tennis team. He was forbidden the honour of representing the school against Hickling Green, the most important fixture of the summer. He would have to be replaced by Roger Brown. Patrick had moved to the farthest end of the table, away from Arabella. While he crunched his cornflakes, he stared at her moodily.
She never once looked at him. She kept her eyes fixed on her cereal bowl, her face pink with discomfiture. Even Elizabeth was silent. Patrick had apologized to her this morning. He had apologized handsomely, but he had lost his place in the second team. Nothing she could say would bring that back for him. As the little girl stared at Patrick's sad, crumpled face, she could only feel sorry for him. Poor Patrick. John Terry was released from the sand that afternoon, a day sooner than expected. The doctor had looked by and pronounced him fit. Luckily, nobody at Whiteleaf had managed to contract the infection. It was just before tea. With joy in his heart, after being cooped up for so long, John rushed down to the school gardens. He made straight for the potting shed. He knelt down by the big cupboard and opened the door. He peered inside. He expected to find some fine specimens of lettuce in there, carefully wrapped in newspaper. The cupboard was empty. He hurried round to look at his lettuce patch. He stared at his plants in shock. They were almost drowning in pools of water. There were slugs crawling all over them. Most of the plants had been decimated. Elizabeth never came and pulled any, even though I wrote to her. He was deeply disappointed in her. She must have forgotten. I'm surprised. Deeply anxious, he hurried to the tool shed and found a trowel and some newspaper. Then he worked his way up and down the two rows, examining each lettuce in turn. His shoes squelched in the mud. From his fine crop, only a single lettuce in each row remained intact. One a round one, the other a cos. With nimble fingers, he gently eased them out of the soil, careful not to damage any of the fine leaves. He wrapped them in newspaper and left them in the cool cupboard in the potting shed. They were not the best two, he thought in despair. They were not the two I would have chosen. I only hope they are going to be good enough. I'll take them to the church hall tomorrow. That is the day you are allowed to leave entries. He arrived at tea very late. A big cheer went up. All the children were pleased to see John fit and well again. But Elizabeth saw him shoot her a puzzled look. She feared the worst. Are they all ruined? She whispered when they found each other after tea. Nearly, he said with a brief nod. He looked hurt. But as Elizabeth explained about the special meeting and the dead slugs and being banned from the school gardens, his face paled. Poor Elizabeth. Then, oh, there's nothing else I can do. I shall have to go and explain to William and Rita. But you mustn't, John. She pleaded. You know it's a secret. You always wanted it to be a complete surprise. At least wait and see if you win the cup. I don't expect I will. He sighed, but he looked at her gratefully. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'll find some way of putting things right for you. I promise. Elizabeth nodded. She had complete faith in John Terry. Things were indeed put right for Elizabeth. It happened in the nicest possible way. John's two remaining lettuces won the cup. At the last meeting before half term, he was called up onto the platform by William and Rita. John held the silver cup aloft for the whole school to see. The children clapped and cheered and drummed their feet on the floor. It was such an honour for the school. There was going to be a photograph in the local newspaper. Everybody would see what fine things they did at Whiteleaf School. We have another announcement to make," said William solemnly, when the cheering had died down. On behalf of the meeting, I want to make a statement. Elizabeth Allen has been seriously misjudged. When Sophie saw her with the dead slugs last week, they had come from John's slug traps. She was worried about John's project while he was in the sand. She knew his secret plan, but also that it was against the rules of the competition for him to receive any help. She was simply turning the pests over with a twig to check that they were properly dead. Stand up, please, Elizabeth. Elizabeth rose. With due ceremony, Rita opened the big book in which everything that happened at the meetings was written down. She was holding a pen. 
The meeting wishes to delete all record of Elizabeth's supposed wrongdoing and punishment. Please accept our apologies for our hasty judgment, Elizabeth. As Rita wrote in the big book, Elizabeth was given a round of applause. So that's what you are up to," whispered Julian as he sat down. There was an amused light in his eyes. Did John use milk in his slug traps? Is that what the jug was for? Elizabeth smiled guiltily. I didn't use any, though," she explained hastily. I'm so glad I didn't. It would have been breaking the competition rules. Our bold bad girl break any rules? He mocked. Oh no, never! In an instant, they were serious again. For William had a final announcement to make. On one matter, I regret to say, the book must remain open. We still do not know who played the unkind trick on Mamselle. Until the culprit owns up, or the truth comes out in some other way, none of us on this platform can rest. Nor could Elizabeth or Julian. Chapter Eleven. The correct conclusion. The two friends longed to know who had really hidden Patrick's racket in the beast's car boot. It had been at the root of so much trouble for Elizabeth, and was still not resolved. Patrick no longer knew what to think. He was so forlorn about losing his place in the school team through his own stupid behaviour that he tried not to think about it at all. A few in the class still wondered, though. Julian was by now deeply suspicious of Roger Brown. Elizabeth was inclined to agree. I have to admit, it was very clever of Arabella to realise that Mamselle's tin looked the same as the tennis tin, and that one could be mistaken for the other. I had no idea she had so much brain power. She proved herself a better detective than us. Yes, agreed Julian. Neither of them knew that it was Molly in the kitchens who had pointed this out. Even if Arabella did get the wrong culprit, but you're right, Elizabeth. I feel quite miffed not to have thought of it myself. It does provide the perfect link with the mystery of the missing tennis racket. Both tricks intended to get Patrick chucked out of the second team," nodded Elizabeth. "The first because he would have played so badly without his proper racket. The second to get him in disgrace for playing a stupid joke on St. Faith's." And Roger, the only chap with a motive," added Julian. "Well, he's got his place back in the team now, after all," said Elizabeth. "Oh, Julian," she said impulsively, "I do think it's such a shame about Patrick. I don't hate him any more. He was so silly, letting himself be stirred up by Arabella. She's such a mischief maker. But I wish he could get his place back from Roger. He's the better player anyway." I expect we'll lose against Hickling Green now. You are very noble, Elizabeth," grinned Julian. Then he sighed. "But how can we prove that Roger's done anything wrong? How can we be sure? Wouldn't he have owned up by now anyway? He's such a decent chap." They both frowned. They had been over the same ground time and time again. Soon it was the day of the big match. Elizabeth and Julian were standing on the upstairs landing, gazing through the big window. Dinner time was over, and the tennis match against Hickling Green was due to start in exactly one hour. Last summer, the match had been played away. Elizabeth remembered it was a good outing. This year, it was the visitors' turn to come to Whiteleaf. The coach carrying the rival team and supporters would arrive in about forty-five minutes' time. A few Whiteleaf parents were arriving already. Some of the pupils had a half-term exeat. There had been bustle and excitement all day as children packed their cases. Most parents would remain for the big match before driving them home. Elizabeth was staying on at school over half-term for a camp in the grounds. Joan was staying on too. It would be such fun. Watching the early cars roll up, Julian concentrated on naming all the different makes. Elizabeth, bored by this, was still fretting about Patrick and the mystery, and whether Roger had been to blame. She knew that Julian had been keeping a careful eye on the senior boy. No, nothing suspicious, I'm afraid," he reported as Elizabeth returned to the subject yet again. 
In fact, just the reverse. Each time I watch him, he looks more down in the dumps than ever. It knocks a big hole in our theory, Elizabeth. She nodded. They had both noticed it. For someone who had got his place in the second team back, Roger hardly seemed overjoyed. On the day it happened, he was seen walking around school with an anxious frown, and the frown had just got deeper and deeper. Did you see him at dinner time? Continued Julian. I thought Patrick looked miserable until I saw Roger's face. It just doesn't make sense. And look at him now! Exclaimed Elizabeth, pointing. Look, Julian, there he is. I can see him. Look over by the tennis courts. The big boy had just appeared, wearing his tennis whites, racket in hand. He had begun pacing up and down, up and down by the empty tennis courts. He was waiting for the match. He was all ready to begin. But there's a whole hour to go yet! Exclaimed Julian. What strange behaviour! Julian, why don't you go and talk to him? Asked Elizabeth suddenly. I'll stay here. What? Accuse him? You mean? Asked Julian. For a moment, his usual sang-froid deserted him. How could he, a mere first former, accuse one of the most senior boys in the school of wrongdoing without a shred of evidence? Don't be silly, Elizabeth. It might just be his nerves. It probably is, which means he could be grateful for someone to talk to. Exclaimed Elizabeth. Of course, I didn't mean accuse him, but you never know. He might open up a bit. You might find something out. I'll keep out of the way though, or he'll be on his guard. He knows I got into trouble over the slugs and everything, but you can do it, Julian. You know how grown up you can be. Julian smiled. He looked interested. It's worth a try, he said. He strolled nonchalantly over to the courts. Elizabeth watched from the window. Hello, Roger. Want a fruit gum? The big boy stopped in mid-pace, close to a wooden bench, blinking. His thoughts were far away. Someone was proffering a tube of sweets, waving it under his nose. Oh, hello, Julian. Here, have a fruit gum. Give yourself some energy for the big match. Thanks. Roger took the sweet and popped it into his mouth. Gosh, Roger, you do look nervous. Do I? He sucked hard on the gum. Matter of fact, I am a bit. Julian sank down on the wooden bench. Automatically, Roger sat down beside him. It would seem unfriendly not to. Julian was a nice kid, very intelligent. Well, you can only do your best," said Julian comfortingly. "That's what my mother always says. I wish my father said the same. He says you've always got to play to win. You can't go through life being a loser," Roger burst out. And he should know. There are so many of his old sports cups in our house. It takes a week to clean the silver. Julian looked at Roger's big, gentle face with sudden interest. He offered him another fruit gum. It was a black one this time, Julian's favourite. But he felt it might be a good investment. Is your father coming to watch you today? He asked casually. Is he coming? Exclaimed Roger. He's flying in specially. He's cutting short a business trip. All the time I've been at Whiteleaf, he's been longing for me to make the school teams. I tried and tried and never succeeded till this term. As soon as Dad heard I'd made the second tennis team, he said it was a dream come true, and he'd be here to watch me play in the Hickling Green match, no matter what. He thinks I must be a late developer, and he says this will just be the beginning of my sports career. There was a desperate look on Roger's face as he said this. As a matter of fact, Julian, I'm pretty scared of letting my father down today. It will break his heart. Julian, with his bright, intelligent green eyes, looked at the boy beside him, at his ungainly feet and his large red hands. Won't he be pleased when he hears about your academic scholarship? He ventured. Roger shook his head. He was deep in thought. He thinks sports more important. He's too old to play sport himself now. He wants to sort of live it through me. He knows about the scholarship already. The news came through just before he left on his last trip. It must have been a bit of a worry for you," said Julian, treading very carefully, when you lost your place in the team for a while. A worry? It was a nightmare," exclaimed Roger unguardedly. 
There was no way of letting Dad know. He was already in the States, you see, and there was nowhere I could telephone to stop him flying back today. Roger suddenly clammed up. He felt he was letting his tongue run away with him. Julian was sitting very still. The word states had sent a little tremor through him. So Roger's father made his business trips to America then. Roger was lumbering to his feet. Well, that's enough. I can't sit here all day eating all your fruit gums, can I, Julian? He said awkwardly. He fished something out of his shorts pocket. Here, have a crisp. They're good ones. It's my last packet till Dad gets here. He produced an open crisp packet. Julian stared at it. The words on the front said "Southern favourites." I'm sorry, Roger. He burst out. He truly did feel sorry for the big gentle boy. I'm sorry, but I've guessed the truth. Even before you offer me a crisp, Julian produced the matching packet from his pocket, tattered and crumpled. He had been guarding it carefully all this time, just in case. You dropped this by Miss Best's car, the time you hid Patrick's racket in her boot. Then, when that didn't work, you tried to play another trick on him with the slugs. He thought Elizabeth had played those tricks. That's why he lost his temper with her, and why you got your place back. But it should be Patrick playing today, shouldn't it? Not you. Roger sank back down onto the bench. He looked anguished. He buried his face in his hands. My father's coming. He groaned. He'll be here soon. He's flown in from America, specially. Please don't give me away. He begged. I was honestly going to confess everything after half term. Once this match was safely out of the way, I intend to own up at the next meeting. I promise. But let me play today, please. I have to go and consult Elizabeth," said Julian. He suddenly felt desperately torn. We'll decide this together. Please let me play," begged Roger as Julian walked away. Elizabeth said that there was no time to lose. They must go and find the head boy and girl and ask their advice. It was much too big a decision to make on their own. William and Rita, without hesitation, reached the correct conclusion. It's all very sad," said Rita. "Of course, Roger cannot be allowed to play." He has done such bad things, but more to the point, it would solve nothing. He would simply be storing up more misery for himself in the future. His father would expect him to get into teens at his next school," agreed William. "The misery would just go on and on forever. Mister Brown must be made to face up to the truth. Just because he was a sporting hero himself, it does not make Roger one. His talents lie in other directions." And he must be brave and tell his father the whole truth. Even as they were discussing it, Roger had come to the same conclusion. Eyes blurred, he set off up the school drive. He would wait at the gates for his father's car. He would tell him the whole truth and ask to be taken home straight away. William was about to leave the study to find Roger when there came some alarming sounds through the window. A blaring horn, the scream of car brakes, a cry of pain. They all rushed outside. A heavily built man was kneeling on the school drive beside the prone figure of a boy. He had been driving fast. He had raced all the way from London Airport, anxious not to miss any of the match. "It's Roger!" he cried out to him in horror. "It's my own son! I've knocked down my own son!" They all knelt round the boy. While Rita rushed off to find Matron, oh, let him be all right! Please let him be all right! Roger's father kept saying, "What was the matter with him? He was wandering alone in such a daze. He was right in the middle of the drive. I couldn't stop in time. He was very upset, sir," Elizabeth said quietly. "You see, he knew another boy should be playing in the match today. Somebody much better than him." He cheated to stay in the team, but it wasn't for himself. He did it all for you. For me? Asked Mister Brown. He was stroking his son's head. He knows you want him to be good at sport, said Julian. He couldn't face losing his place in the team and letting you down. There was a long silence. I've been a fool, said Roger's father at last. Oh, please let him be all right. 
matron arrived. Should we call an ambulance? asked Mr. Brown, looking fearful. Matron kept everybody back while she examined Roger and took his pulse. Then she looked up in very great relief. Pulse good and strong, she said. No sign of any broken bones. I'm afraid his head must have struck the ground. He's concussed. I think he's just beginning to come round. Even as she spoke, Roger began to stir. He groaned once or twice and then opened his eyes and saw that it was his father who was bending over him. Dad, I've behaved stupidly. I've let you down. I'm so sorry. Hush, said his joyful father. He soothed his son's brow. I know all about it now. I'm the only one who's behaved stupidly, but I promise you, Roger, things will be very different in the future. There was just time for Patrick to change into whites, find his beloved tennis racket, and fill the vacant place in the second team. Elizabeth had begged Mr. Johns to allow him to play. He was so happy to be back in the team, but he was sorry to hear that Roger had been knocked over by a car and had had to go to hospital for a checkup. He was very surprised to learn that Roger had been the person behind the beastly tricks, but relieved that none of it had been anything to do with Elizabeth. So she did not dislike him after all. Whiteleaf defeated their old rivals that day, and Patrick put up a very fine performance. There was much cheering and clapping as he came off the court. It was his play that had made all the difference. Patrick walked up to Elizabeth and, in full view of everyone, gave her a big bear hug. Will you forgive me for being so beastly? he asked in embarrassment. It was so clever of you to find my racket that day. Fancy your noticing that the boot of the beast's car was open just a few inches. If you hadn't noticed that, I would have lost my place in the team. Everything would have been completely different. Over on the bank, Arabella watched and felt grumpy. Why did people always end up liking Elizabeth? Elizabeth just stood in the sunshine and gave a happy little sigh. She was pleased that she was staying on at Whiteleaf over half term. It was the best school in the whole world. She thought of all the efforts she had put into trying to help John Terry. In the end, he had won the cup and surprised the whole school with no help from her at all. But she was proud to have kept his secret. The person she had really helped was Patrick, and even that was an accident. She still didn't know why the racket had been hidden in such an unlikely place, though she learnt later that Roger had planned, in fact, to hide it in one of the garages until Mr. Leslie, the science master, suddenly appeared on the back drive. Roger, in a panic, had fled, thrusting Patrick's racket into the nearest car boot as he went. But there was one thing that Elizabeth never did find out. The little song she had taught Sophie about Patrick being made of slugs and snails and puppy dogs' tails was the inspiration behind Roger's failed plan with the tennis tin. He had heard Sophie and her friends chanting it as they skipped one day, and it had given him his brainwave. With the naughtiest girl around, these unfortunate things just seemed to happen. And felt grumpy. Why did people always end up liking Elizabeth? Elizabeth just stood in the sunshine and gave a happy little sigh. She was pleased that she was staying on at Whiteleaf over half term. It was the best school in the whole world. She thought of all the effort she had put into trying to help John Terry. In the end, he had won the cup and surprised the whole school with no help from her at all. But she was proud to have kept his secret. The person she had really helped was Patrick, and even that was an accident. She still didn't know why the racket had been hidden in such an unlikely place, though she learnt later that Roger had planned, in fact, to hide it in one of the garages until Mr. Leslie, the science master, suddenly appeared on the back drive. 
Roger, in a panic, had fled, thrusting Patrick's racket into the nearest car boot as he went. But there was one thing that Elizabeth never did find out. The little song she had taught Sophie about Patrick being made of slugs and snails and puppy dogs' tails was the inspiration behind Roger's failed plan with the tennis tin. He had heard Sophie and her friends chanting it as they skipped one day, and it had given him his brainwave. With the naughtiest girl around, these unfortunate things just seemed to happen.